welcome, welcome, one and all. Welcome to Funkatopia WTF. And I am your host, Mr. Christopher. This is my co-host, Jeff Page. <laughs> get extra front in there. A little long one this time. Yes, you get to do it. And uh, I'm trying to work on the, the marathon front, but uh, it's, it's just going to take a little bit of diaphragm work. So, you know. Yeah, I know. It's, you know, we, uh, that one week you actually had the sound effect, which was kind of, uh, was just it was, just wasn't the same. I actually still have it somewhere hidden. Uh, yeah, like, it's, let's not bring up. Let's not let's not introduce technical issues again. <laughs> no, it's still, it wasn't related. Wait, wait, no. Can you hear so, that? Like, no, I don't hear it at all. My see, business then. That's all. <laughs> see, this is what I'm talking about. All right, so tonight we have an amazing, amazing guest. I am so so excited because uh, let me tell you, it is, uh, it, and Steve will tell you. I literally probably irritated the crap out of him. But for some reason, the only reason why I could even get to him was through my personal account. It wouldn't let me talk to him through the Funkatopia account. So I had to go into the personal. So every single time I, I reached out to him, it was like, he blocked you. He was like, no, it's like, Hey, Steve, this is Chris it's from Funkatopia. Out. It's <laughs> me from Funkatopia. I don't know why it doesn't say Funkatopia or why it's not letting me talk to you, but there it is. I got your Funkatopia right here. Yeah, it's just, he's just like, go ahead and hit the hit the hit the pavement there, sir. So, anyways, pavement. he is the man responsible for so much artwork in the print world. We're going to talk a lot about it. We're going to talk about not only his photography work, and we're talking about his his sketch work that he does, the art stuff that he does, some of the album covers that he did, like some of the explanation like New Power Soul, mm -hmm. and of course uh, Raven to the Joy, Fantastic, and I think Mass Emancipation's over there too, Graffiti Bridge, and uh, Chaos and Disorder, I and mean, we got all these, I mean, he was there and doing so much of it, and I have so many questions, and there are so many stories, and, and I'm just, I'm very, very excited to have him on board, so let's just go ahead and just get it out of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage the one, the only, Steve Park. What's up, brother? Hey. Hey. Quite the introduction. <laughs> I was over here, like, blushing like crazy, so. Do you, do you I'm, already, I'm already read enough. <laughs> <laughs> It is perfectly okay. It's, I mean, it is an honor to have you on board because you know all of your accomplishments and in, in that, even that short win. It wasn't really a short window. How many years were you uh, technically in Prince's employee in some form 13. or fashion? Thirteen. Yeah, that's like, that's pretty sizable. There's not a whole. There's not a lot of people on staff with him that, you know, typically have maintained that long of a tenure. I mean, there's certainly band members that have not even made to half that. So. <laughs> you got to look at it like that for sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> so, my tenure got to be a teenager there, so that was cool. So I guess we'll start with the with the obvious because uh, one of the things, and and I will uh, do my best to uh, keep keep an eye. Can you see the little comments on the bottom of the screen? Oh yeah, I think so. Hold on, give me a second because I got some <clears throat> window black. Oh, well, hello. Yes. Okay. Hello, yes, yes there is big yes. poof, just like that. Yeah. So there's. Uh, yeah, so there, there, there's a bunch of people here, so we want to make sure that we kind of put them, pull them all up. The <laughs> what? No flash again. Uh, yes, and uh, there's, so there's so many people here, and um, yeah. So if there's questions that pop up, I'll put them. But we've we've got a pretty good set of our own, so we're gonna take it from here. First off, let's start here. Uh, how did you actually get into? Um, how did you actually get into, you know, start drawing? When did you realize that you actually had a little bit of a skill set? You know, how did your parents actually, you know, support that process? And let's just start there. Um, well, I mean, my mom tells me now, she's like, oh, you knew you want to be an artist when you were four years old. Of course, I don't remember four years old. She does, but I don't. Um, probably by the time I got into junior, uh, junior high school, probably where I started to notice people were seeing what I was doing and being like, oh, that's really cool. Um, so that's, that's when I would say I'd started to at least, I don't know, get some idea that I was good at what I did. Um, but it was just something that um, I read comic books a lot as a kid. I had a, there was a guy when we lived in, um, my family was military when we lived in Germany. There was a guy there who uh, was friends with my folks who would draw comics like superheroes and stuff for me as a kid. And I was like, that's really cool. I'd love to do that. So that probably influenced me a little bit too. But um, it was just something I enjoyed doing, and I and I always did it, um, even through college. I, I was actually a theater major in college. Um, you know, got bitten by the acting bug in high school. Um, the 
irony of that was that I got to um, create a lot of images for the for the school plays and stuff like that. Um, so I got a lot of practical experience as an artist rather than taking a bunch of art classes, um, which was kind of cool. So yeah, so that was. Um, I, I think just basically the point I was like, I don't necessarily want to be on stage. I, I started doing a lot more tech work, um, painting sets and things like that in college. And I started to realize, you know, what a hard way it was going to be to go. When you get out of college, you know, you're never going to get cast as that like old guy because they have actual old guys or you're not going to get cast, you know, like as somebody that you're not, you have to play you to some extent. And I'm like, ah, eh, it's not interesting to me. So, um, so I just followed the, the um artwork i guess you know yeah well and i imagine that's kind of you know that's kind of challenging when people come to the realization that you know hey if there, there's not anything interesting or i guess really that stands out about you as a person as a character not that you don't but i'm just saying when people realize as an actor or an actress I really have to bring something different to the table to get a, yeah. attention. I can't think of the yeah. guy's name. I was just watching uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. And mm -hmm. that one actor that's really has really unusual features that plays like one of the, uh, the federal government police officers. He's got this really old school 50s look. Uh, and he's a younger guy, probably in his 30s. But I just see him in a lot of movies now. And I think. See, there's something is a perfect example of somebody who has a really distinctive look and he's in like, you know, he can be used for a variety of different scenarios. And you're like, OK, like a Steve Buscemi yeah. type of character, too. It's like, you know, I know exactly what he what he's a perfect fit for. So, yeah, if you don't, yep. it's good to come to that realization. So, oh, yeah, yeah. How did you so give me for people who do not have your book, which is fantastic, mm -hmm. by the way, um, kind of give people an idea of you know, how you got connected with Prince and how you ended up in that universe. So through the eighties, um, well, I was in college and high school, actually. Um, I, I took advantage of the fact that I worked for the school newspaper and I did music reviews and stuff like that. And so I would call promoters and uh, say, Hey, I worked for this newspaper. I didn't mention that it was high school or college. I just said this newspaper and ended up getting passes to go photograph that stuff. So, you know, I just had a little pen tax, but I'd go and I'd shoot as much as I could shoot. And I got to meet people and um, I ended up doing some work for promoters in the DC area, um, which was cool because I got to go, you know, do fun stuff. Like I, I was at a backyard barbecue at the Bar Kays. I went out for a day on a bus with uh, Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam and uh, Full Force and shot them all day. And I have all these negatives and stuff. I just, I just don't know when I'm going to get time to actually get them processed so that I could actually share them with people, but I will eventually. Um, so I had done some of that. And one of the things I got hooked up with was um, a local radio station before there was MTV, um, was it Friday night videos? Um, and they always had a local station that would uh, run them. But the guy there, I knew him from oddly enough, when I was in high school, he, I ran into this guy at a kid's disco, like it was for teenagers. And uh, he, I don't know. He was talking to me for a while. And he goes, Hey, would you want to be on our show? I'm like, what's your show? And he said, it's called kids world. I'm like, yeah, okay. Why not? And this is when I still, you know, had ideas of being an actor. So I ended up interviewing people like Muhammad Ali for that show, Casey from Casey and the Sunshine Band. I did all this stuff. Right. And then he said, Hey, you have a camera, right? I said, yeah. He goes, would you want to go to these shows in town and take pictures of the artists? And then on Friday night videos, we'll show those um, like who's been in town and, and feature your, your stuff. And I'm like, Sure, why not? So one of the sh shots I did or shoots I did for that was Lionel Richie and the opening artist was Sheila E. I'll be honest, the reason I was there was Sheila E. Of course. <laughs> I'd seen, hey, listen, I'd seen the Commodores, you know. Hey. And so uh, anyway, um, I shot uh, some of the show and then I had backstage pass. So I'm standing backstage and Levi Caesar was back there and I recognized him from the band. And we started chatting a little bit and he's like, oh, you're a photographer. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I do photography, but I really consider myself an artist. And he's like, really? I said, yeah. He goes, can you draw me something? And it was the literal pen, napkin. I drew a picture of Levi, <laughs> I gave it to him. And um, he stayed in touch with me when he went back to Oakland. You know, if, if you remember back in the day when it was actually an effort to keep in touch with somebody in another, you know, especially across the, entire country uh but he stayed in touch with me and um you know i would talk about my work and stuff and he says well you know um 
well, he got, then he got pulled into Prince's band. He's like, oh, I'm going to be in Prince's band. I'm like, cool. And I went out and visited him at one point. And unfortunately, Prince was out of town that weekend. So I didn't get to meet him. Uh, came home and he just said, hey, if you are doing some artwork, I want to show it to Prince. And, um, and so I did some things and, and I was sending like original art through the, po from, through the mail. <laughs> and uh, he showed Prince some of it. And I guess he liked it well enough that um, you know, I got a call from, I think it was Alan Leeds asking, would I want to do a video set? And of course I said, yes. I mean, why would I say no? Even though I was like, well, let's see, I've had some experience in that. <laughs> Not really, but some. And so I went out and um, got some people from the Minneapolis Children's Theater who were awesome, who helped me put that, um, it was the um, Glam Slam video. And uh, Prince left for what, a weekend uh, to go to France. And um, as soon as he, before he left, I had to show him a, a, a sketch and you can imagine I was so nervous. I was like, Oh my God, I'm actually in the prints, but I had to like keep it together. So, you know, I could, I could get the work. And um, so I found literally an old piece of, you know, um, illustration board that was in the trash, you know, and it was cut all jaggedy and stuff and some uh, colored pencils. And I got a um, schematic of the stage and, you know, copied that onto it and just went around Paisley looking at everything that was going on at the time. Um, you know, from his wardrobe to just, well, you know, whatever, and put it together and he approved it and he left. And so I was determined to get a third of that stage done while he was gone. And the people I was working with thought I was insane. Um, of course, I was 25. So of course, I was insane. Um, but I, I stayed up three days straight and I got a third of that set done. And when he came back, I heard nothing. And um, I was a little like, oh, my God, I, I was raging. So I, I asked Levi, I said, um, what's the story? I don't, I don't get it. Like he, he didn't say anything. He goes, Oh no, he didn't say anything. That's good. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> I didn't know that was a deal back then, you know? So that was, that was the start of it. That's awesome. Now I actually have, now I, I heard, now I'm going to pull up this real, real quick. Yep. That's it. See how, this, see how, look at, look at that board, man. That was looked like that when I got it. It was terrible. <laughs> You needed an etch a sketch. That's I know, right? I know. Um, well. And what I find fantastic about this is that you know that's also the same. Um, when you look at the the actual, uh, this is the the concept drawing that you had, which ended up being this. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty fantastic. And uh, this this tour itself was unfriggin' believable. It was probably. Oh, yeah. Minus his final concert in Atlanta, uh, the second to the five. I was at both shows in Atlanta uh, when he was here for his last two shows. The second to the last, I was in the fifth row. That was probably the best seats I had ever had. But for this tour, you know, this is back in the day of, you know, you basically want, you say, I want two tickets and you pray that you get a decent seat. <laughs> right. And somehow we got two tickets, right? My, my friend Rob and I got two tickets right on the front row balcony for wow. this so not only that'd do great we... that'd be great seats for that oh yeah. yeah so we got to see the whole entire thing from above there was we didn't have to stand up the whole time we could just sit and just relax and just watch this whole entire show and it was just fantastic just kind of watching this whole thing just kind of unfold yeah and what's other what's also cool so so how much involvement and you said you had you said you had a third of the stage ready. Which which third of the the, the um, stage? I know exactly what it was. It was the side. Okay, so what I had done was the flower in the middle, and then the whole section around uh, Sheila's drum kit. Oh, so that that third right there plus the flower in the middle is what I had finished when he came back. Now I did have two other people helping me, so you know, it's not like I could do all that by myself. But um, what was funny was if you guys have been to uh, you've been to the sound stage, right? Yes. Okay, right. So you know the catwalk up top. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the way I could see that flower developing as I painted it was to run all the way up to the catwalk and all the way back down and paint and then go back up and come back down and go back up and come back down. That's why you were um, 25. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's funny. Uh, the first time I was back at uh, Paisley when I was at well, the first celebration and I was shooting, um, I was like, oh, the catwalks, I'm going to run up there. And I was proud of myself, man. I could get up there and I'd get back down. I only did it once, but I did it. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, and of course, then on top of that, what ends up um, is that it's actually part of the Glam Slam shoot as well. The yeah. Glam Slam video shoot. 
This is actually a screen capture from from the Glam Slam video shoot. It looks like some of those pieces are. I mean, you can't really see like the colors and everything. I guess because maybe because the lights sure. are walking some of it out. Was like some of it not done at this point, or? Oh no or, no no! What you saw what you saw there was exactly how much this was finished at that time. It's just that they use colored lights and things, which are going to react differently with everything. And the funny thing is, the guy who was the director on that, he apologized to me afterwards. And I'm like, why? He's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like, why? He goes, I just can't believe that, you know, Prince had that mask on and I did not come over and do a, a single shot of those eyes under the um, swing set. And I was like, yeah, it does kind of suck, but <laughs> it's all right. You know, it was just funny. But I got that whole day too. It was fun for me because they they brought me in to be like, if there was anything that needed to be touched up on the set or whatever, like if any of the paint, I guess, came peeling up. <laughs> from uh from his heels uh he did put a hole through the stage in in rehearsal uh actually put his foot down hard enough did one of those booms and his his heel just punched a hole right in the in the wood and so they uh, fixed it overnight and, and i just touched up that area but not during this not during the shoot so that was good man it's just it's just amazing to kind of just see all this stuff you know evolve and and i guess what's what's even stranger about it is I, I can't imagine this being one of the first things that you've done to kind of, yeah, it was quite, yeah, it was quite a task. Um, you know, I, but I just, I guess I was like, I, very, I was confident in what I could do and I wasn't going to let the opportunity pass me by. So I did it and I, you know, I worked really, really hard to make sure it happened. Um, one of the, one of the interesting things for me too was during the, so I would paint all night. We had to finish around five o'clock or so in the morning because we needed to put a bowling alley finish over the parts we had done so we'd have time to dry. Um, they had like a big uh, HVAC system, or I don't know if that's what it's called, but it's a system that pulls stuff out of the out of the uh, space because, of course, they do things like that, like you know where they need to be pulling smoke out or whatever if they're doing a, a show or um, filming a movie. Um, so it had to dry before they came in, before the band came in, and those guys would rehearse eight hours a day most of the time. I'm not, I'm not joking. It was eight hours solid. So I would go to sleep around six o'clock if I was lucky, because, you know, after you're up all night, and also I, I might have been doing a lot of caffeine. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, I, I would come back in at one o'clock because they started at one o'clock every day. I'd come in at one o'clock and he'd let me just sit on the stage. I just usually sit over to the left of the uh, swing set and watch the entire rehearsal until they were done. And then I would start my thing. And the funny thing, I'd kind of forgotten about this. And, and uh, I actually had this conversation with somebody the other, uh, a couple of days ago because somebody was saying something about Quincy Jones. I'm like, oh, Quincy Jones. Yeah. You know what's funny about that guy? He kind of disses Prince. But one, t one time I came in, I'm sitting off to the side like I usually did. And I suddenly looked up and I was like, oh, there's somebody sitting in that swing set. Like, and then I'm like, oh, that's Quincy Jones. That's cool. Quincy <laughs> was losing his mind over that show he was like mm, mm, mm. like he was just stomping his feet to it and he was getting into it so it's funny to me because i i've heard bits and pieces of things where he's like well you know prince went eh, whatever you know whatever he was or was not um but i'm like dude you were you were loving that show there is no doubt in my mind that you were loving that show so you know what maybe your brain's a little foggy <laughs> yeah yeah, I think that the collection of clips that they play is specifically him dissing Prince's piano playing. Oh, he's an okay piano player. Right, and right, somebody right. has somebody masterfully put together like a 45 second clip of as Quincy Jones dissing Prince on how he plays piano and then Prince doing like these really intricate runs and stuff. And it was just funny the way they kind of put it together. But it's yeah, I've never really kind of understood that. I mean, obviously you have the whole uh scenario where he was definitely representing michael jackson to to a t and they kind of set mm. up that, set up that verses going on so i guess he kind of felt like he needed to play the part but you know uh yeah. i don't know I, I just so but i can't get around that quincy jones was sitting on the swing <laughs> yep i just want to make sure i heard you correctly Yep, he was sitting on the swing. Yep, yep. It was just funny to me too because, like, I was already involved in their their rehearsal process. I was just watching them do their thing, and then I look over and realize there was somebody sitting there. Like, I just hadn't paid any attention, and um, and then I'm like, 
oh, that guy looks so weird. Oh, it's Quincy Jones. Like, it was like just like that. Like, oh, it's Quincy Jones. Okay. And then I just went back to watch the thing. And then I'd look out of the corner of my eye and be like, oh, he's just, he's digging it. He's digging it. Oh, man. I only met Quincy Jones one time and I was 14 and really didn't have a, a, an appreciation for who he was or what he did. My mom was like, you need to get your picture taken with this guy. And I was just like, who is he? He was like, it's Quincy Jones. Like, all right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So good, good, good for parents. Hey, my story of being a parent in that case was um, I worked with the uh, Polonius Monk Institute of Jazz for quite some time before I ended up working with Prince. And then, of course, once I got pulled into that, I didn't have time for that anymore. But uh, I went to one of their shows when my son was eight. Um, and it was a celebration of Aretha Franklin. And uh, my son's sitting next to me, and he's, he's listening to all these women come out and do tributes to Aretha. And he's like, oh, yeah, she was good. Oh, she's all right. You know, she was, I'm like, okay, whatever. And then Aretha comes out, which I don't think anybody knew. And he listened to her for like five minutes and went, she's the best one. I said, that's Aretha Franklin. <laughs> so after the show, he goes, can I meet her? I said, sure. So I've got a picture of him sitting next to Aretha Franklin. I mean, he's like, you know, well, he's a big kid, but he's still, he was a little kid and just sitting there like, that's <laughs> next to Aretha Franklin. He's the yes, best. Boy. Always get the photograph. Always get the photograph. <laughs> I remember in your book, um, and by the way, at some point tonight, I am going to uh, give away a copy of Steve Park's book um, because I have two copies and I can do that. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, obviously, whoever contributes, you know, really you know, contributes really well in the chat area and really kind of gets into it. If you don't have the book, um, I like to send a, a copy out of the book, but in a What's really, really neat about this book, which I you don't see a lot in some of the uh, photography books that are really kind of around prints, is that I love the fact that every few pages there's a story. And it's not like a like really, really, you know, a super heavily involved story, but it it, it kind of you know captures a moment uh, that that's about that photo. and sometimes 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 not. Um, and you told a photo, uh, you told a story about uh, when you were talking about your son's name to Prince. And so I want to kind of have you kind of retell that story. But also the second part of that question is what is, is your son following in your footsteps in the art world, the music world? What is he doing? You know, how, how are things going with him now? And let's start there. Okay. Um, so I'll tell the story of uh, the conversation we had. He, we were in the garage down, downstairs. And um, I don't know what we were doing in the garage, but we were in the garage. And uh, so he was just asking me, like, you know, do you have a name picked out? And I said, yeah, we, we have a name picked out. And he said, what is it? And I said, it's Duncan. And he goes, okay. And I kind of did that like a little grumbly thing. I mean, he was kind of, he, I felt like he was ribbing me. He wasn't, I don't think he was serious about it. And I said, well, you know what it means? And he goes, what's that? And I said, it stands for Brown Warrior. And then he goes, oh, that's okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's funny that I knew that too, because when I was looking up the derivation of the name, I kind of wanted to know what it was. It was one of those situations where we didn't want to do a family name thing because not my side of the family, but let's say my, my ex's side of the family, you know, she, she admitted that it would have been problematic if it had been anyone's name that wasn't them or something. So we just picked our own. And so then our joke also used to be for any, um, any of the fans that would know this would be, um, there can be only one. <laughs> That's right. Highlander. Yes. Highlander. <laughs> Cause we, we were pretty sure we weren't gonna have a second one. So that was kind of a joke with that. Um, as far as what he's doing now, he's learned a lot of lessons from me. Um, he, He's a huge music guy. Um, he played bass for quite some time. When he was, by the age of 10, he'd already played almost every major club in town in Baltimore because of the School of Rock. Um, he plays drums, he plays bass, he can sing. Uh, but when he got into fifth or sixth grade, he um, got into robotics. And of course I was like, why, why do you want to do that when that's so, so mentally challenging? He says, I like it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, I can't argue with you like it. You know, um, so he went to school, he went to Johns Hopkins. He got a full ride to Johns Hopkins on his own. Um, he graduated um, with uh, a degree in engineering, a minor in engineering and a minor in, um, uh, I always want to call it accounting. It's finance, there we go, finance. And um, so, yeah, he, um, he, he's a really hardworking kid. He's very thoughtful, very innovative. He, he can also like, when he was um, playing rugby, cause he also played rugby cause he's like six, or three um and a big guy 
um, he uh, would also design things for their uh, team for for you know for the webs uh, the websites for Facebook and all that. And he was good at it. He, like he would he'd show me stuff. What do you think of this? I'm like, that's really good. So maybe move that over a little bit. But otherwise, it's really good. So he's got a good design sense as well. Um, I think this is just something he wanted to do. But he's always he's also one of those kids that is like. He settled into a very good job right now, but I think he has higher aspirations. I think he wants to, you know, move what he's doing forward more and get into the more creative end of, of engineering as well. He's even told me though, he's like, oh, maybe I'm going to go back to school and study law. I'm like, why? And he goes, because it'd be fun to, you know, represent these firms that have all these tech things. And most um, lawyers don't really know much about the product. I would know stuff about the product. I was kind of like, okay, okay. So he's there got my go. drive. He's just chosen a field that is going to be much better to him financially, probably. And he's also <laughs> saving money. He's already putting money away. I mean, at that age, I wasn't thinking about that. No. You know, he's he's already you know got the highest matching you know four hundred one k stuff with his company and everything. So you know he's got he's got it together much better than I do in some ways. Yeah, well, well, I mean, I the musical chops from because you know we've got your photographer, artist, painter, actor, all those things, but you haven't talked about music. So where to get those chops from? Um, okay. The only thing I did, I never played instrument. I was in a, I was in a band through, I was a band of high school, I guess. I, and I was in musical theater, so I did, I sang. And um, I, I, I was in kind of a band that then wanted to go heavy metal. And I'm like, I, I'm doing theater. I can't, I can't, you know, tear my voice up like that. But I've always been like a huge fan of music and I've always, been able to look at the structure of music and and there's a lot of things i'll talk about with musicians who are like oh you must play music i'm like no i just listen really hard you know um i don't know he just had it on his own and he was a huge he just loved music he and he loved playing it and he loved victor wooten he loved he's got a bass strap that is signed by so many bass players and the back of it has jeff beck's autograph he made jeff beck sign the back because he's not a bass player wow wow <laughs> Yeah, because because Rhonda was was with him, and so we went to see the show, and you know Rhonda signed it. But he's got like Stanley, he's got Victor, he's got um, I think he's got Paul Peterson on it. Um, and I'm trying to think of who else. He had a couple other people, but um, yeah, he just he just was into it, and he's one of those guys that when he when he gets into something, he he dives full in. And um, Victor told me I took him to his music camp a couple of years, and um, Victor told me he said you know his. What was his left hand his hand yeah this left this hand he said is like or what was his hand one of them was like super strong like he said he was amazed at his age that he could play like that and then uh, they do do a thing where they would take the kids and let them they'd have to shift their instruments to you know in there's a big bunch of instruments on the stage and they'd have to keep a groove going and shift instruments throughout and uh, when he got on drums i'm talking victor's talking to me you were sitting out you know out in the audience basically and He's talking to me, leaning over his chair, and he suddenly hears that. And he turns around, he looks up, and he goes, "How come you didn't tell me about that?" I'm like, I, "I didn't know. I knew he played drums. I just didn't know he played that good." So you know, he just practiced and got good at it. So yeah, he's he's got a lot of skills, and and he he loves playing music. He's told me he loves playing music. He just got tired of dealing with having to be in bands and stuff, and uh, the sort of the dynamics of it all. But he said, you know, one day I'll retire, and I can buy all the bases I want. Like, that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm still cracking up that he made Jeff Beck sign the back. <laughs> he was, I swear to God, he was he was only like nine, not or something like that, nine or ten when he did that too. I said, uh, Don't you want to get Jeff Beck's autograph? He goes, Yeah, but help sign the back. I'm like, why? And he goes, because he's not a bass player. I'm like, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, but he I mean he predates he predates all of those <laughs> other bases. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know how old he is. I think he's uh he's 80 no so he was he was 19 was yeah he was born in the 40s so yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> like, you, yeah. Mm, he's up there are you sir you signed the back of the strap <laughs> that's he, that's he. i don't well, i don't think he was that obvious to him about it i just think he just presented that sign look it's empty you'll be the first one <laughs> Oh my gosh! And it will rub off too as he starts to play. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> my goodness. That's so cool. let's talk a little bit about art too, because one of the things that I had seen, um, and I want to go ahead and just preempt this to all the folks, uh, which are uh, a couple hundred right now listening on the Funked Up app 
around the world. Hello, how are you? How are you? I hope you all are doing fantastically well. Let me just say, I apologize moving forward because we're going to get very, very visual here. We're going to talk a lot about some of his artwork. We're going to put some of it up uh, and kind of discuss some of it. Um, but I'll try to be as verbose as possible and I'll ask Steve to do the same so that you guys can at least feel like you're part of this conversation. But one of the things that you had mentioned in the book, obviously, was um, a couple things. Uh, painting the, I want to say you did some artwork inside of the Glam Slam Miami. Yes. And also, uh, yes, yes. And also some artwork uh, inside of Paisley Park. Now, there is artwork everywhere uh, in Paisley Park. I mean, from the clouds mm -hmm. and the, the foyer area, all that stuff. Um, can you, and this actually, I'm going to actually pull up a picture of, uh, this is actually obviously posthumously, but they have mm -hmm. the graffiti bridge, uh, graphic that's up there on the right hand wall for those that have been to Paisley park before, you know, while he was with us and maybe even some of the stuff that exists right now, let's start with Paisley park. What are some of the things that people can look for that you've done throughout Paisley park? Uh, right when you come in, the bridge that's over the top, it's basically on the second floor. Um, I did the eyes that have the symbol there with the kind of ray coming out of it. So that, was, that wasn't a painting, that was a, a digital thing. Um, I, it was funny because I, you know, when, when I went back, I looked at it, I was like, oh, wow, Photoshop really had a lot of cheesy stuff going on. <laughs> because it's like there just wasn't you know like now you can go find like you want clouds go find clouds really easy you know i made those out of whatever filters and tried to squish them around to look a little better because it was and it was something you wanted quick so there was no you know and then i didn't know you wanted to put it up there i was like oh wow okay um you know that's how things would go sometimes it'd be like i need this boom and then you find out where it goes and you you're like i wish you'd given me a little more time you know but that's the way things went um so that's the first thing you would see. And then the overall paint scheme that's still there, I'll be honest, I was quite surprised the first time I went back. Um, I thought all of that would be gone and he would have gone to something else. Um, the building was very much a um, studio. And so it was very professional uh, with professional offices and all that kind of stuff. And so there were pale blues and pale pale like off whites and, and some um, not quite pink but like that that kind of mauve look to it um and so one night uh he came in and was saying that he didn't he wanted something more creative to to, to make it feel like a creative place and um i went around this this is my thing like you know i i my camera at the time was a polaroid <laughs> so i literally went around taking polaroids of the building we scanned them in and he just sat there with me and we just kind of hammered out ideas and stuff and um just drawing right on top of the um the scanned polaroid and um i printed some copies out we took them home the next morning he called me and he said um you know i was in there earlier and he said um hey i need you to get some people that can make this happen i'm like make what happen he said i, I want to paint the inside of the building to match what we did last night and i'm like okay <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I, I had to open it up on my computer and go, oh, I hope this looks good. I mean, how, how was I going to know? I mean, we're, you know, the, people do this professionally, like this is their job and I'm just doing it, winging it in the middle of the night. And uh, they came in the next day and they started doing it. And um, I think, I think maybe he had had, you know what, I now that I remember, I think he had somebody like a professional designer come in and they were kind of going very, uh, like, upscale fancy and it wasn't very it wasn't very visually compelling it was pretty but it was almost like very static um yeah because i think he saw a wall and he was like he, that's not what i want you know so um so they came in and they started uh, you know repainting some of the same people came in and uh i just watched it go and i'm just like oh, please god let this look good <laughs> you know in the end and um I, like I said, I was surprised that so much of it was still there. Uh, what about the honest. inspiration wall? Did you have anything to do with the inspiration wall, or did you see? Uh, it no, that was Sam. Sam Jennings did that. Hey, uh, that's I did that, the, the, I'm glad you said Sam but, Jennings. I was gonna. I was wondering if you ever got an opportunity to actually work with him because he was so. Oh, yeah. He was so integral in putting together, and he's been on the show. He was on the show, I think, last year. We went over all the old websites, 
uh, with the Prince Online Museum.com. We went through all the websites and we we're just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, what did it take to kind of go through some of this process and whatnot? Yeah. Did you provide some of the artwork or help him with some of the artwork for some of that stuff or not? Um, he was there. Um, if he was so much on site at the time like he came out for celebration um he was out there because he was running like the web stuff and everything um I'm trying to remember how we got to know each other we got to know each other very well but i think it was a little bit outside of paisley more because just because of the fact that he was so involved in the website thing and i was really not you know that just wasn't my forte and um so yeah i mean we talk like a ton and I'm just trying to think of context. It's hard because it all runs together, you know, and there's so much going on all the time. Um, yeah, I can only, imagine. but, uh, but I did do, so the wall though, that if you turn the corner going down the hallway next to the soundstage, that kind of history wall, I guess I would call it. I did. I put that together. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah. That was fun. I've done that. So yeah, I know in your book, you talk a lot about the fact that, you know, Photoshop had just come out and you just got done making a comment about how Photoshop was kind of, was very, very wonky. It came on, I think back in the day, it came on like six disc, six floppy disc or something. And yeah. it was like, it was like a nightmare. Well, there uh, weren't layers. There weren't even layers in Photoshop when I first started using it. <laughs> I remember those days. Yeah. And, yeah. So how do you feel about, you know, as an artist, how do you feel about what's going on now? I, I, this is not even on my list of things to ask you, but I'm always curious from an artist's perspective how you feel about what's going on now, not just with the movement in AI, but also with um, with everything that they're incorporating now into Photoshop. Do you feel like it is stealing from an artist the way the AI kind of takes pieces from what people do? And uh, how do you feel about AI in general? So at this point, I feel like it is because it is, it is. So there's a web website you can go to where you can check to see if your work is on a list of things to get mined. Mine is on there for prints. So that means anytime somebody's pulling up, you know, like making AI prints or whatever, my stuff is getting pulled in. Now, when, when music started getting sampled and people start pulling other people's music in, there were no repercussions at first either, but eventually they had to pay for it. And so my thing is this, if you want to do AI, somebody is paying the artists at least something for using it or for, for pulling it into their system. I mean, that's okay. As long as the artists are cool with it and as you know, and all that. Um, but the way it's been done, you know, like, cause so here's an interesting thing. They've proven that AI cannot take other AI art and make new AI art out of it. So that tells you that it has to have an organic source for it to work properly. So that, that I was reading that the other day and I was like, what? Oh, that's interesting. So it can't build on itself, which means it can't really be learning. What it is doing is it's just finding a better way to, to stitch things together. Um, mm-hmm. Do I think it's the worst thing in the world? No, I, I, have, I have some people I know that use it and they use it in a way that you would be, you would never know it was AI because they are doing First of all, they come from an art background. Um, one of them uh, was a photographer for a lot of years, but he did a lot of things that were, you know, outside of just straight, you know, shooting. And he's managed to do things. I'm looking at it like I cannot even believe you can do this because it looks nothing like what the stuff I've seen before. And it's because he is really specific about what he wants. He will take things once he gets the pieces he wants. He'll combine them into different ways and things like that. So, you know, is he creating something new? He is because he's adding to it. Um, I just don't like when people say like, look at the art I made. And it's like, you didn't make it. You're, I, I, I joke that you're an art director because what an art director does is tells an artist what they need and what to do. And then you, and then they do it. So, okay. If you want to be an art director, cool. Just please don't say, you know, you created it because you didn't. Um, so I, I'd say that's probably my, my thing about it um, is just, having some sort of compensation for any artist who's pulled into that system is fair. Um, and then if you're creating with it and making other things out of it and moving it into something that just doesn't come spitting out of the computer, I mean, you're still doing art, you know, um, just, just like using samples. I've heard people take samples. You would never know where those samples came from if they, if they do, you know, something where they really, really mix it, but still, it still is a sample, still you know? Sample. Exactly. Yeah. 
a lot oh, yeah. of about how they're supposed to treat AI and how they're supposed to not use something or or make sure you identify that it's IA and AI. But you know, people people do what they do. Uh, yeah. And it takes yep. the skilled artist, the skilled person to go in and create the prompts and actually make real art out of it and do something with it. But yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that look for shortcuts and they get a lot of credit for it too. And it's, it's too yeah. bad. It's too bad. Yeah. It's just, and, and that's it. What you just said is they get a lot of credit for it. Yeah. They're, they're, they're never going to take away from what you do. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, because if you can find as much AI art as they want, but if they compare that to the work you've done, can't touch it. You know, it's, it's right. just, left and night day left right dark light you know whatever it is completely like no nah, i don't think so but they yeah. still get credit for these things and that's the hard part so yeah. yeah and i could i can also agree with you that you know not calling yourself an artist because right. if you can't recreate what you just did from a blank canvas you can't you know or, or even come even close. close to it then what's the point you know yeah that's just kind of a, let's talk yeah. some print stories and then look sure. at some photos too because um one of the things that i loved was the story about one of my favorite all-time albums stevie wonder's fulfilling list first finale this is yeah. one of stevie's most amazing albums i just i love this album i have worn this album out it it looks like every <laughs> it's i've worn this album out and you tell a story in the book about this album uh, that you were sitting with Prince in the office listening to this album, and there was a track, uh, They Won't Go When I Go, and in the lyrics it says, When I go, where I'll go, no one can keep me from my destiny. And you said that Prince turned to you and said, I'm just not going to go at all. What do you, it, that really hit me because I kind of felt like there was a lot more there that could have been expanded on what what did he mean by that in that moment do you think um to be honest i don't know that i could speak to what he meant at the time i mean i think he was being just kind of like that funny kind of cocky guy like yeah but i'm not going so don't you know that kind of thing um <laughs> i think for me in the moment of writing that book it was a little bit of a I don't know, like a reality check in a way, because, you know, saying something like that and you can laugh about it and you can say, yeah, well, I'm just going to be around forever. That's how that's going to work. But then the reality of things is very different. And, I, and that's sort of why it came back to me, I think, uh, was more my my feeling about hearing that um, and then, you know, being in the moment I was writing. Uh, Kind of made it for me. It kind of made it sad. You know, don't mean to bring it down, but you know that's no, how I, I felt about it at the time. Okay. Um, somebody just said something about transitioning and things like that, um, and that's very possible too. Um, there it is. You know, because we transition, we're energy source, we can, and it can never not exist. Um, you know, he and I had a lot of conversations about that kind of stuff over over time, um, and uh, which was pretty great. I mean, it's it's really weird having those conversations with somebody. At, three in the morning, four in the morning, because you get pretty raw because you're really tired and you just say what's on your mind. And so we, we had a lot of conversations back and forth. Um, and uh, it was kind of cool because he, he was very open to things I thought, and um, he was bringing things to me like, well, I read this, you know, and, and, and this, and so it was really cool. And, um, and, but there was a lot of that about kind of energy perpetuating and, and always flowing and always being, uh, no matter what actually, you know, what, what else happens, you know, uh, whether we feel the loss here, um, that there's something that continues to go elsewhere. Um, so we had had a lot of those conversations. Um, that was a time. good insight. Viol I mean, uh, Sybil about Violet the Order God, I'll die, but I won't go away. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he did actually make a lot of those types of, of comments, which I always found really, really interesting. Obviously I won't get an opportunity to be able to, kind of go a little bit deeper with him on that. But um, yeah, some of this, if you really kind of deep dive into some of his lyrics, it's pretty intense. Um, oh, yeah. Another thing I found interesting, we're kind of in the uh, the Prince story thing, and then we're going to move into to photos after this question. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of times when people mention uh, Prince, um, you know, just kind of his off time or whatever. I've seen a few times people say, oh, we we were all sitting around watching David Letterman. Uh, we went over here and we were watching David Letterman. Oh, we were just chilling out watching David Letterman. 
I what I find really interesting about this, and maybe you can kind of speak to it, um, because there was Prince and David Letterman had a lot of ins and outs. You know, sometimes he'd be ticked off at him. Sometimes, you know, he wouldn't, but he always seemed to be, he always seemed to really love watching Dave. And what, I mean, I, I think what really kind of sparked this more than anything or caused a lot of the issues was the whole debacle when he appeared on the show and David was making all these comments about him changing his name to a symbol as any comedian would do. Um, what was, did he ever speak publicly about him and and David or how he felt about David because it, he seemed to watch Dave quite a bit. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he never said anything uh, directly about it. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the stories in the book is that, is that we're we're watching um, what we're we watching uh, uh, Destiny's Child is one of them. We're watching them on uh, on there, and uh, it was it was me and him and Larry Graham sitting there and. He's like, yeah, you know, Destiny's Child. That's a lot of name to live up to, you know. Before they started, they and they finished up, and both of him and Larry were just kind of like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know? um, and then uh, he, I, I turned him on to um, No Doubt, and um, so he would always like, um, you know, like he's like, um, hey Steve, come down. We're gonna watch David Letterman. Uh, no Doubt's on. I'm like, cool. And so we sat there and watched that. And when um, I don't know if you guys remember that, but Gwen got up on the table. And was facing David, just like sing to it. And when she jumped up there, Prince jumped up, and he's just like, "Yeah, you know, he's like, get it, you know, like that." And, and uh, that was fun. He's like really excited by that because I think he saw something like, "There's someone who's not afraid to take chances. There's someone who will just, you know, do whatever they want." And um, you know, and then we went. We ended up going to the show uh, when they came through town. He invited me to that show, which was fun. Um, it was also on the heels of a tornado. Um, and, and keep in mind, you know, we had no GPS back then or anything. And uh, I was trying to get downtown and, and all the roads had had trees across them. So I had to like figure out how to get downtown, uh, the back roads, get down there, see the show is really great. Got to go backstage, meet Gwen briefly. And I'm like, this is awesome. This was a great night. And then he's like, um, you know, meet me back at Paisley. And I'm like, oh, it'll work. Oh. So I'll go back to Paisley, I'm up at my office and I get a call. And he's like, where are you? I said, uh, I'm up in, up in my room. He goes, we'll come down to uh, B, I think it was C, I think it was Studio C, the one in the middle on the back um, where they kind of had the, the um, Boots exhibition that they, they had back there. And he says, come down. So I come down, I walk in, he's at a grand piano, Gwen Stefani standing next to him and the two guys, the bass player and the guitar player are plugged into the wall right over here. So I just sat down between the two of them and they just jammed for like an hour and a half and i was the only person there that wasn't a musician which was really cool wow yeah wow. it was pretty awesome that's pretty good yeah, gwen's a monster i mean i i've seen her do some pretty amazing stuff I, it seemed like the first time she really got my attention i'm not just musically but watching her perform she was doing she was performing the song i'm just a girl and she was climbing up the scaffolding of the wherever she was at. It was an outdoor venue. And she literally was climbing like all the way to the top of the scaffolding. And all the security people and her, you know, her people were losing their minds because like, <laughs> so you're not insured for that. You're not insured. No, oh my gosh. But you know, I mean, uh Pearl Jam used to do that all the time too. Not only that, but you know, literally swing from one arm from the very top of the scaffolding. It's like, what are you doing? Oh my God. Uh, all right, let's get into the artwork here because that's sure. this is what everybody you know it, it, you're the most well known for, especially in the purple community. So we're going to start in the most obvious place, which is a Graffiti Bridge. Now, mm -hmm. uh, for those who are listening on the app, once again, I'm sorry this is a very very visual show, so you can just watch the video later once you park your car and you get to a safe place. But uh, the top image is the original image. And then the bottom image is essentially what was used for the album, which obviously has some some interesting differences between the two. Um, I you know I guess because of the attachment to the movie, you had to incorporate Morris and you had to incorporate Ingrid. But some of the yes. decisions I wasn't really sure about, like why the jacket was changed from red to translucent. I guess underneath his earring. I was trying to figure well, out. Well, it's actually it's actually black down there because if you remember in the film, his his jacket was black. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so tell yeah, me yeah. about how you put this together, and maybe there's some some little intricacies about this particular picture, like some little pieces of it that maybe people haven't noticed. 
Sure. Um, okay, yeah, so the top one is the way I, like, I originally painted it. Um, so this all came about, so I, I'd done the whole Love Sexy thing. They went on tour, and I was kind of like, oh, maybe that's it. You know, I mean, I don't know. And so I decided that I needed to um, look into getting, you know, some more work. And um, I said, well, let me do a painting, show kind of my skill set where I'm at. Um, and I might as well incorporate prints because that's something that I could show later and see if something, you know, maybe he'll want me to do something else uh, based on seeing this. So, um, so obviously I took a, you know, a photo reference for him. It was a Jeff Katz photo that I used the photo reference from. And then I just started kind of thinking, okay, what would be cool in here that I haven't seen him do in his artwork? So like the moon was a cool thing, I thought. Um, I like the, you know, the sky with the clouds thing. That's something I like. So I enjoy doing that. Um, the Paisley window, you can see right above the, um, right above the flower with the sunset in it. Um, there's, uh, the, the, the window, like right when you see Paisley park with the little round piece up there at the top, um, yes. the square window, um, the, the, a lot of this for me. So for me, I'm very visually oriented, so I don't necessarily a lot of times what I do is this, I'll look at something and I just be like, Ooh, that'd be cool. It doesn't mean I have a huge idea behind it <laughs> other than it's like, that would be cool in conjunction with these other things. And I think that I'm sure that underneath there's some thoughts to symbolism in, in it, but it's, it's on a very, uh, like it's, it's not up here. It's, it's back in here somewhere. And so, you know, and I usually have like a million ideas racing around anyway. And so um, I realized at a point, like I kind of think like this, like stuff's going around in a circle and I go, oh, I like this thing, put it in the cart. I like this thing, put it in the cart, this thing, put it in the cart. And then I take the cart and go, that's a good ingredients. Wait, one more thing, boom. And that's sort of how I did this. I, I near, near my old place in Baltimore, there was a brick wall that I always thought was cool. It had a big hole in it and it had some of the um, brick revealed and then the rest was stuck though. So I just thought that was a cool like portal into something. So then I uh, put these classical angels they're based off of a renaissance painting um the tree uh most people don't see it but if you look at the tree so you got all this lightning going to the tree sort of energizing the tree but i want to put it upside down because i thought that was kind of a cool idea but if you look at the leaves some of them are turning into digital um squares um you got to look really closely of course you can't see it here um and that's like one of those little things i hit in there because i thought that was cool like this organic thing started to have a digital feel to it um the little um window area behind the woman has actually um it's kind of a purple purpley pinky thing going back there and it's got little footprints in the dune it's like a dune back there the um guitar is the guitar shape of the guitar that prince was playing at the time uh around love sexy but i liked putting this um uh I'm trying to remember what it was i just thought it was cool it was like a cosmic thing or not cosmic thing it's a um what book did was I looking through just like all these cool designs, and, but they really were, um, they're like things you see under microscopes and, and all that. So that's what I put in there. And I remember kind of deciding, like, I like that piece because it has a little eye right there. Um, kind of like at the top, there's a little eye. Then there's a little Japanese, um, some Japanese symbols going up, which I know mean something because I, I made sure they did, but I don't know what they are. And then I thought it was fun. Like at the very, very top, it's like the, the sky is peeling away from the background. There's a little thumbtack that's pulling out of there. I thought that was kind of fun too. So yeah, it was, it, you know, like I said, it's just like all these weird concepts. All together. I know there's always some, some extra, extra. And uh, one of my questions is, what was the idea of flipping it? Okay, so that, that yeah, matters. the reason it, yeah, it had to get flipped because, because of the way the album is set up. So a, when you, when you look at an album, the cover here, when you do this and you turn it here, it's going to be that way. So it has, that's what it had to be. And he, and he, the prince had called me and said, you know, Hey, I want to try and make this the album cover. Um, so I took a, I took a shot of this and sent it to Levi in a little transparency. And, and Levi told me that prince put it on his desk and he was looking at it every day, he'd go in there and prince would be looking at it. And he says, I think he's going to do something with it. I'm like, oh, really? Because like I said, I, my goal was maybe to, to inspire him to do something, not necessarily take this piece. Um, and then, um, you know, it ended up being, and he called me and he just said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this work. And, um, you know, but we're going to have to probably flip the album. And he wanted to put, you know, Morris and Ingrid in. And then also um, the face on the model got changed to look more like Jill Jones. I had to change that too. Um, 
which was tough to be honest because you know it's like Jill's half her face is hidden because of the way it was already set up but <clears throat> I did it and the other thing about that is so this was all painted on a board right and I had to sand out the areas where Morris went in and I had to sand out like I actually had to sand the paint out <laughs> and paint back into it which I had never done before because I, I was like I don't know how to do this and I asked some people that do airbrush work and I'm like oh god I have to sand the board uh but I did it you know and uh, it ended up being the, the record, which was really cool. And then when I saw the movie, and I, so when I started this, I didn't know they were doing a movie. And then um, Levi was telling me like, oh yeah, we're filming this movie. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, he told me some about it like while they were filming it, but I didn't know anything about it. And so it's really interesting, like the angels being in there, um, like the lightning was really prominent in the film in places and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's really weird that a lot of that stuff kind of synced up with, with stuff in the movie. Um, and I had no clue. So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, some of it looks very, very, or seems very specific to the movie. It's just, it's really yeah. laid out. Yeah. Wow. But, um, so how exactly did, is this just part of like, hey, you know, you're you're getting paid salary for for working with him, and it's just part of what you do? Did you get like a, you know, some type of commission for the start? How did that all? Yeah, play this out? one, this one, Warner Brothers paid for. Him. So uh, a funny story about that. Um, you know, they they sent me a contract and they're like, you know, we, we want to use this album cover and you know for all the things, all the promotion, blah 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 blah. And you get this money, and I'm like, ah, right, cool, you know, <laughs> this is great. And um, you know, man, I lived I lived in a part of Baltimore where the money I made on that set me up for an entire summer, and I didn't have to work, which is great. <laughs> and then um, um, a friend of mine was out in L.A. and he said, oh hey, he called me up. He's like, hey, I'm out in L.A. I said, oh, what's going on? He said. Um, I'm seeing your movie poster. I'm like what? And he goes, yeah, yeah, the Graffiti Bridge movie poster. I'm like, oh, really? Huh. Uh, so I was savvy enough at that time to go like, probably supposed to get paid more money for that. Mm. So I called, I called Warner Brothers. You know, like I found a phone number and I called. And the guy, the guy on the other end, he's kind of like confused. He's like, so who is this guy? So why well, did the album cover for Graffiti Bridge, which you guys have used for movie poster, but you know, we didn't. You know, we didn't negotiate anything for that. And I had friends of mine who actually worked, um, uh, had done a lot of movie posters. One of the guys did, he did like all the old Star Wars posters and stuff like that. So I talked about what they got paid for that stuff. I was like, oh, really? Wow, that's great. So I knew a number. So when they uh, said to me, well, how much do you want? And I told them and they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm like, all right, well, cool. Well, I'll get back to you. Five minutes later, that's fine. Because I think, it, you know, in retrospect, I could have said, any number they would have had to pay it because they already started marketing. They already started a marketing campaign and I had not been paid. They did not have the rights to use my artwork, for that, right. which is hilarious. You know, so um, anyway, uh, it's kind of a funny story. And so then, yeah, so then I had money for the fall and the winter also. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Can I, yeah. would you share how much that was back in the day? Oh, hold on a second. That was funny. Can I, can I leave the screen for a second? I yeah, Cause my dad held on to this. This is why it's funny. My dad held on to this. So I never graduated from college because obviously I changed kind of my idea of what I was going to do in life. And so my, my dad was kind of like, you know, he wasn't thrilled that I didn't get a degree, uh, but I'm like, I don't want to spend another year getting a degree. So when I got this check, I sent him, uh, the, uh, canceled check. Or what is this? Yeah, this made this a Xerox, but I sent it, and so then here it is. Wow! <laughs> yeah, nice. yep. right. No. Yeah, because my, because my, uh, yeah, my dad kept this, which was really cool. And so he, he just passed away a couple years ago, and my mom wanted me to have this back, which is really very nice of them. So for, for those on the on the funked up app, it was fifteen k. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. But yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, at that that time in my life, man, I'm I'm telling you, that was like that was a year's salary to me at that time. Wow, that's fantastic, uh, man. Yeah. That's that's very very cool. Thank All you. right, so let's talk about some of the album stuff. Um, sure. I thought that I had uh, the truth here. I don't. It's somewhere behind me on here. But uh, we're gonna talk about uh, we're gonna talk about this this. Uh, I don't know why it's why it's going small, but we will. Uh, let me see if I can put this into play here and there we go. Um, tell me about this because uh, some of the things that you had denoted in this book about 
um, the album cover and specifically that some of the stuff that you had shot inside that you actually liked the stuff inside of this better because it didn't really show Prince's face. So there was kind of like a little bit of a mystique to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the decisions that were made on uh, the truth. So uh, the initial thing with the truth was it was going to come out as a full fledged CD. Um, and then um, as, you know, as he does, he started on, you know, thinking about the, um, the crystal ball project. And um, so he's putting all that together. And so then the next thing I know, he's like, well, I'm just going to put that in here and I'm going to put, and he'd already sent out cassettes for reviewers to, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the little cassette that had this picture on the cover. Um, but he'd sent it out to reviewers and stuff and, um, and sent me a copy too, which is really nice of him. Um, but uh, anyway, I was kind of disheartened because it was one of the things where I had had some time to work on it because he just kind of let me do it on my own um, while I was doing other things. But I was really pleased with like how the type came out and everything like that. Like I really want to mess around with all these typefaces and make them work. I always loved how Purple Rain had that. And, um, you know, to, to be honest with you, it's like I learned, I mean, I learned design on the fly with him. I did not, I really did not have a whole lot of specific design skills when I went in there of, of, of actual layout, you know. Like I could look at something and go like, oh, this, this would be cool here, this would be cool here, this would be cool here. But I had to learn all this stuff as I went. And, um, you know, it's like trying to catch up to these amazing people like Warner Brothers had, like Margot Chase, who did the Graffiti Bridge um, logo, has done so many awesome hand-drawn logos and stuff. And so, you know, I'm dealing with what typefaces are kind of available in the 90s. <laughs> Not so many. Um, fortunately, this guy, Chank, um, Chank Font, Chank Diesel, he made fonts. He's in Minneapolis. He made fonts. So a lot of this stuff ended up being his fonts, which is great. He made this, like, this symbol that's on the cover. He made an entire series of uh, symbols, which are on the um, tour book. Uh, I guess it's the new Power Soul tour book. Um, it's the one with him with the microphone gun in the red. And if you look down the side, there's a um, hit of clear varnish with all different versions of, of the symbol. And uh, Prince liked it. He, he actually liked all that because I was a little worried he was going to be like, you know. And, uh, but he liked the fact that somebody put that into a typeface, which was really cool. So anyway, um, but with this, I messed with all these, um, with all these different uh, typefaces and really worked hard to get that stack that's on the back right there uh, to look really good uh, because, uh, and maybe I just mentioned this, I don't remember, but I love the Purple Rain treatment, how it was all for each song that it, like had its own typeface. I thought that was so cool. So I kind of wanted to do something similar to that. Um, but yeah, for the insides, I mean, honestly, I can't remember what they were, but they were just more abstract, more just like, what is that? Oh, wait, that's a this, that's us. And I really enjoyed that process and, and gave some breathing room to the typography, which I really hadn't had a chance to do before that either. Um, and so it was pretty disheartening when, you know, it got just tossed in with the, uh, with the crystal ball. Um, so, but this came out. So I am super happy that we got to do this at least. And um, this, uh, this shot on the left uh, with the back is um, a shot from um, a bunch of images that I had not found. <laughs> so I was looking around and he's playing a George Benson, uh, a guitar that George Benson gave him in that, sh in that shot. So um, I'm going to have uh, several, actually several more of those, which is kind of cool. So. Well, um, I know that one of the reasons why he put it in with Crystal Ball was because there was this massive delay when people were, were ordering it yeah. from 1 800 yeah. New Funk. And it, so he ended up putting this one, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I get it. Yeah, in conversation. Yeah. But I was also really curious about if it had been released by itself. I want to get into the music side of this, but if it had been released by itself, I'm kind of curious how it would have stood. Just because everybody knew that Prince progressed and kind of morphed into whatever he wanted. I think this was so far removed from anything that he had ever done before. And it was so raw and it was so, so it would have been interesting to see exactly how the market would have accepted this album as a standalone. I think, I think you would have got a lot of new fans out of it because people that I played it for ultimately, uh, people that were not, you know, Prince fans per se, or not really into, you know, funk music or jazz or anything like that. They love this record. They were like, wow, this is amazing. Oh, that's I, great. Didn't, I didn't know he could do that, you know? So I think if it had come out at the time it was going to come out, it's a little like, 
it's kind of like the black album i mean you know it was pre me pre me being there but you know i was a fan i collected all that stuff and if the black album had come out when it was going to come out it would have been a game changer but you know it's it's his choice that's what he wants to do pull it you know because yeah. he, he's not happy with the content that's totally his you know his prerogative yeah all right so let's uh and and actually while we're while we're talking about truth here for a second there was a couple i'm going to kind of bounce just for a second because you had mentioned in the book that you had actually heard uh since we're talking about the truth which is you know primarily an acoustic album that you had actually been privy to a a recording session or just i guess recorded session mm -hmm of an acoustic blues album that he has that's i guess still sitting in the vault can you tell me a little bit about what that was what, or what i was privy to was him playing acoustic blues while i was photographing him <laughs> <laughs> and uh i said to him i said when are you gonna put that record out he goes i'm saving it for when i'm old and i'm like you know the fact that he's thinking ahead like that like oh yeah i can do this now but you know i'm gonna save it so um yeah that was a great shoot because i think we shot for I wouldn't say an hour, but probably like close to an hour. And uh, the whole time he was just playing a bunch of acoustic stuff. And the cool thing was, is the guitar pick that's on the inside of that. Um, if, if you looked on the liner notes, there's a little a, a black a black pick that has a symbol on it. And it's a, it's a thin acoustic pick. That's the pick he was using when he was playing. He gave it to me after the shoot. Wow, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. Because I mean, just having to be there and hear a lot of everything that's going on um between that and also you had also been like one of the few people on the planet to ever hear the song mind blow mm -hmm. and uh, yep. i'm just like you didn't really go too much into what that song actually sounds like and i know we're not here to talk about music but i am curious what the vibe of mind blow is like it was very quiet and it was all acoustic and it was very short but it was also you know very personal um type of type of vibe to it, which is, I, and I'm guessing that's probably why I didn't make the cut, to be honest. You know, it's one of those things like probably you put down and then liked it for a minute and then it was like, mm, mm. <laughs> so, so no, I, I felt really good to, to be able to hear it. He, he would bring me in now. So this is something I didn't know until seems fairly recently anyway. Um, but some of the musicians that, you know, were in there with him told me that, you know, he didn't bring people into the studio that weren't the musicians. Or the, or the people that worked with him in the studio, he says they were like, "You're the only person he'd ever bring in here and let hang out while he was recording and and uh, stuff." So that was really cool. I didn't realize that. I just thought that was like, you know, if he was happy with something you did, he'd be like, "Come hear me play," because who wouldn't want to hear me play? You know, like I do. I definitely do. I guess not everybody. That's not everybody's idea for a reward, but it's mine. You know. So um, yeah, I was very fortunate in that regard, and it was hilarious because I remember times where he'd call me down. And he'd be, you know, he'd just be playing a riff on the guitar and he would start talking to me while he's laying the, the track down. And he'd be like, so what do you think of this? I said, oh, it sounds great. And he goes, yeah, this is going to be good. And I'm just like, wow, this is so cool, you know? Yeah, yeah it, I've was, heard lots it was of, incredible. I've heard lots of stories like that where he'd, have, he'd be playing these very, very intricate riffs and runs and be having a conversation the whole entire time. Just like, it's just muscle memory just kind of just kicking in so to know that oh, yeah. there is an acoustic blues album in that vault plus mm -hmm. on top of that that other album instrumental album he has with mono neon black is the new black mm -hmm. that's also in the vault to know that these full blown albums are in there is just that's just staggering i can't wait to hear it let's talk about the next album here uh exodus, oh, exodus. yeah 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 so that was yeah. michael van huffle and i we, we busted our butts on that one um so this is again pre photoshop you know did not have layers but they made a they made a standalone program that worked through photoshop that allowed us to composite all this stuff together and these are all debbie mcguan's images and we would just scan them and cut them up and and create things out of them um, michael worked a lot on this so i want to just make sure to give him credit because a lot of people kind of gloss over him but he did a lot of stuff and it was really funny i did not know how to use indesign at all uh, or cork. It was cork at the time. That's what it was. And, right. um, I needed to hire someone who knew what to do. Like I could give direction, but I didn't know what to do. He came in super cool guy, you know, said, yeah, I know how to do all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Great. Come in tomorrow. We'll start working. Cause that's exactly what I needed. Someone who could just come in the next day. We just killed it. We just did all kinds of things and we were all, and, and we got to be great friends, still are great friends. 
Um, and one day he confessed to me, he said, I had no idea how to use Quark. I went home and read the book then, that night. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> He's like, no. I'm like, I'm not that person. I can't learn like that. I have to put hands on. He just sat there and read the book and knew what he was doing. I never would have known it unless he told me about it. So, but um, yeah, so we were kind of free to do something with it. I think, you know, just make it funky, make it cool, you know. Um, and the inside, it's got Maite's body this way where it's like she creates a kind of a hill and all the stuff is created on top of it. So we had we had a lot of fun. And he he did um, the good life. That was all that was all him. He did that because I was only there. So what was funny was I came in, worked on the gold experience to finish it up because that previous art department just quit. And so they needed it finished. And I didn't know that's why I was coming out, but that's why I was coming out. I was putting... 80 hours in a week at that time. I was eating, I ate Thanksgiving at the, um, what was it? Uh, Planet Hollywood under a, a naked Arnold Schwarzenegger from, um, what was it? <laughs> Not time to stop. It was one of those ones where he was like, he was frozen in ice. It's like, oh, look, it's, it's naked Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm eating like a veggie burger for Thanksgiving here. Um, but that's the kind of, of hours I was pulling, right? And so, um, when I got asked, um, Therese, his assistant asked me, she's like, you know, he wants you to move here. I'm like, nope. And she was kind of like, what? <laughs> I'm like, nope. But he really wants you here. I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm not moving here. And she goes, well, could you come part of the time? I'm like, maybe. She said, what about two weeks out of the month? I'm like, nope. Nope. And she said, what about one week out of the month? I'm like, okay. Now, had she asked me after, you know, if I hadn't been pulling those kind of hours, I'd probably been like, yeah, yeah woo, woo, you know, but I was, I was so exhausted. I was just like, I could not imagine being here full time. You know, as it was, I had just come in for the first time and spent this much time doing this specific type of stuff versus like a stage, which is a one, so it's like a one job. Like you're, you're focused on that one job. We worked on this. We worked on gold. We worked on a tour book. We just did so much stuff and we had absolutely no no, we had, we had nothing. We one time, we we told him one time he goes, I don't know how you do all this. I said we we take lint out of our pockets and we make it into things, <laughs> and that's what it felt like. Like we just, how did we come up with this? Scan some keys and like deform them to be something. You know, it was it was nuts. It was really cool. Though. I mean, it was really cool in retrospect at the time. It was so nerve wracking. And anytime you'd hear his his boots hitting the um, so, so this we were in an area that was actually for storage. Um, you know, like just storage. And they made it into a little art department down there because they didn't have any other room at the time. And so it had a ramp. And the ramp, of course, was hollow underneath. So you could hear him coming down. Like, the other thing is we could hear his steps going up to his apartment because he was coming out of the garage and the step stairs were right above us. We had totally knew when he was coming. It didn't make it any better. <laughs> You're just like, oh, no. <laughs> Do we have enough stuff done? <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic! Yeah. Uh, new Power Soul. This is power this soul. one. I, I actually have Exodus over there, and my ex I got New Power Soul the actual CDs. This is actually really really cool too. What well, the stories with New Power Soul? The this New is, Power Soul. That cover was supposed to be printed on um, with with ink to look like a black light poster on black light poster paper. That was a whole vibe. That was what it was supposed to be, right? So imagine that instead of that. And um, I was so excited because I'm like, this is gonna be cool, man. It's gonna look like a black light poster. And, and uh, he liked the idea too. And then I get this like, oh, we gotta hurry up and get this done. People are waiting on this record. I'm like, what? And it's like, yeah, we can't, we can't take the time to do that. And I sourced that, that to be done, to get it printed like that, to, to look like a black light poster. <sighs> so depressing. Again, I know one of those ones where you're just like, oh, the timing, the timing, the timing. And then it sat in a warehouse for six months. So, you know, what are you going to do? Crazy. But um, but I had fun with it. I mean, I had a good time. Um, you know, Debbie McGuan, I, I used some of her work on the inside and, and some of the band members I'd photographed, I put in there and on top of some of her work and everything. And then I kind of tried to replicate her work with the microphone gun and the uh, necklace and everything like that. Of course, the, you know, <laughs> the tattoo and everything, which again, would have made more sense if it looked like a black light poster for real, like if you you held it and you saw that black flock paper and that kind of ink, you would have been like, that's that's amazing. As opposed to like, huh, okay, cool. <laughs> Which is the way yeah. I thought about it, you know, knowing what it should have been, that's all, you know. 
Yeah, I love the the tour book that you, you did for Ultimate Live. I think I have a picture of that here. That was probably one of my favorite shots. That look, that red, black, stark, contrasting yeah, yeah, colors. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Boxing, uh, dinner, with boxing, dinner with the Dinner with the So that is a, that's a Jeff Katz photo, and then we just took you know basically it was uh, the the stuff from the album, the the symbol from the album, the typeface from the album put on that. It's pre pretty much that was a pretty straightforward. Uh, thing Jeff Jeff came in and shot that. Now keep in mind, I wasn't doing photography at that point because that entire thing for uh, um, for the album was uh, like like I said, I took Polaroids. Like if you look through that album and you see stuff like you know, like the the toilet Polaroid, the burning flowers Polaroid, <laughs> uh, the cover um, had a Polaroid I think underneath of it, but then it was all like. Um, I shot, uh, I think I scanned a 1999 record actually. And, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, broke it up visually to make it look like a shattered record. And if you look at the little Warner brothers symbol, it's got a tear coming off of it. Well, this is, yeah, this is the, the chaos and chaos and disorder, right? Yeah. 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 yeah Cause I think I, I actually have this here. I don't, I don't actually yeah. have the actual graphic, but yeah, that's, and this is actually a, a, a promo copy, but, uh, yeah, yeah. this is. Yes, and there's a lot going on on this. I might well, have to make yeah. big, but there, there is a lot. Oops, I'll make myself big, not you. Uh, <laughs> there is actually a lot going on on the inside. Yep, of that's his Bible. We scanned that. And then, like I said, I shot all those Polaroids. Um, you know, just came up with ideas. Like, you know, he, he just wanted to look rough, you know, but he wanted to look rough, I think, in the way he would, something would look rough that he did, you know. And so that's that's kind of what it was because I'm pretty what's sure that he was not thrilled about Warner Brothers at the time. What's up with the syringe? Yeah. Uh well, it's got money, so it's like blood money. So, right. so there's yeah. money in it, and it's squirting out like the the blood at the end. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah there's so much going on with chaos and disorder. It's just it's yeah. Unbelievable. He just let me go kind of crazy with that one, so I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't expect any less. All right, we got one more. Um, one more album cover. We'll uh, we'll move on to actual photos, which is uh, F Deluxe. Oh, F Deluxe! Yeah, 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 man. I love doing that record. Um, I was really pleased that Paul involved me in this record, and I, for me personally, I I am so happy the way that record came out because I felt like it really did feel like a follow up to um, the first record, like the, that many years later, you know, which I think is amazing uh, to get that sound. But uh, yeah. So I shot, you know, all around California. Oh no, wait, did we shoot California? No, that was, no, that was all in Minneapolis, right? Because I shot. Oh wait a minute, did I shoot Susanna in California too for that? No, 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 no. We shot, we shot um, in Minneapolis. I think that's right. It's yes. all got to run together. Yes. It's, it's all, all, all in Minneapolis. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it was. So we had this cool house there that. Um, Paul knew someone who had this amazing house and we shot all these photos in there. Like when you, when you open it up, I don't know if you've seen the vinyl version, but there's a whole lot more going on the vinyl version. And, um, but yeah, this, this shot with Susanna and it was really fun photographing her. She was a great model, you know? Of course. Um, I don't think I've ever seen any, amazing. I don't think I've ever seen any physical copy of F deluxe, not, not to any other, cause I, I've have it digitally. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think I've ever seen a physical uh copy of an f deluxe album and i don't this don't, doesn't say anything other than i didn't i haven't seen them tour um i don't know they did I, a limited run on the on the vinyl it's a two two yeah. um two vinyl um and it's fun too because i did it all black and white and so i wanted to avoid that here because i didn't want to to draw that comparison between the first record and this record i wanted to stand on its own so i decided to uh, you know go color on this um but when we did the vinyl. I, I was like, Paul, do you mind if I do black and white? And he's like, no, not at all. That'd be fun. And so that's exactly what I did. And, um, and even, even the records, like one of the black record, one of the white record, um, and everybody had their face on, uh, the, um, circle in the middle of the vinyl. So every, every time you flip it, it would be another, like it'd be Eric or Kelly Bean or, you know, Paul, Susanna, which was fun. So do you have any yeah. stories, you know, regarding the whole, the family versus F deluxe, the time versus the original seven, any background stories like either from the band or from Prince that you heard regarding, you know, no, I mean, with, with, uh, 
No, because I mean, at the time, you know, when I was working for Prince, you know, he seemed to have an okay relationship with Morris at the time. I mean, Jelly Bean would come out to every show that Prince played out at Paisley Park. Every I'd see him there all the time. Um, he was constantly out there. You know, he just was a total supporter, you know, and, uh, and he was great. Um, I don't think they had a beef. I think that, I mean, you know, for whatever reason, it became a bone of contention at some point. I, I don't really know what it is. I mean, the guys might know better than I do. Um, I just know that, you know, they they looked at doing the family and then realized they had to check it out to make sure that they could do it and then realized that you know, he owns the... Um, I didn't even know that he owned the absolute rights to the name at that point, but he is still, I think if you went in somewhere and said, Hey, we're doing this thing. And someone comes and says, yeah, but I had the same band this many years ago and I called him this. So I would probably have the rights to it. And it's probably true, you know? Um, so I just think they didn't want the hassle. I think they want it to be free and clear, not have that hanging over them in any way, shape or form is what with, with, at least with F deluxe. I just think they just didn't want to, that to be an issue. I think it was more of if, if my personal opinion, I would think would be music. I mean, because obviously with the original seven, there's nothing written by Prince on it. And the time was his project. The family was also his project. And with F deluxe, there's nothing written by Prince on it. So right. I kind of feel like he wanted to kind of control the output in a little bit of a way. Right. It's like, if you're going to put my trademark stamp on it. It needs to, you know, I need to have some input in what's going to be put on this yeah. album. And I, don't oh, I can see would, that. Yeah. Uh, you also did a lot, you did some in, intimidation. Well, that's the wrong, wrong word, but you, uh, designed some, um, oh, yeah, yeah, cars and stuff. Yep. yes. Uh, how many of these did you actually do as far as like, you know, guitars that you, uh, for, for those who are again, listening on the app, this is, uh, I believe it's called one eyed bass. Yeah, um, one eyed bass. Yep. Yep. And uh, it is basically a bass guitar that you, I guess, took the strings off of and, and did this eye on that he played quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Takumi brought that to me and said, hey, he wants an eye painted on this. I'm like, okay. So I set up I set up my airbrush right, like, right when you walk into Paisley so that I could open the doors and let the fumes out. And um, I would work on it. And then all of a sudden, Takumi come back and go, hey, he wants it. What? I've just picked that. So he'd go and he'd take it back. And of course he'd bring it back and he's, you know, all the paints scuffed up and stuff. And um, it kept going like that for a while. And finally, Takumi took it back and he put it back there and uh, put, stuck it on his uh, the base stand and put a note, do not move. <laughs> so uh, one day, I mean, this is like, I'm trying to do a million other things, by the way. I'm up in my office. I'm trying to get other stuff done that, I, that he's asked me to do. Uh, I mean, meanwhile, he knows I'm doing this to some extent, but I'm not getting any real, you know, focused time on it. And to come to come, he's like, hey, can, can you work on the bass? I'm like, all right, fine. He goes, because he's out for a little while, I can actually take it and get it gloss coated. Because so, that was the thing. Until I got gloss coated, that paint would just come off, you know? And so um, even though it had like a, uh, you know, just a white finish on it, uh, it's probably a primer coat. But uh, yeah, that's how it happened. It, was, it probably took about a week to actually get it finished. Just because of that, you know, just keep having to repaint areas that I already painted. So it's very frustrating. <laughs> but that's the only that's the only one I ever painted. Um, at a point in time before the uh, symbol guitar was actually built, um, somebody asked me like, "Hey, could you make a guitar out of this?" And it's like, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of a no brainer how it's going to look. And so I did up a sketch that was exactly, except for maybe some of the details, but it was pretty much exactly the shape. The only thing that I thought, except um, I. It, how did I feel? I don't know that I said that. I'm glad I didn't yeah, see that. Yeah, um, <laughs> Mr. Prince threw it at the 1999. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I don't remember that. So they just it probably left my head because I was like, ah. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's still not. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird. It's not in the worst shape in the world, considering how old it is at this point. But um, but yeah, but with the symbol thing, the only thing I did different, but then I realized he doesn't do this. I made a um, a capo out of this out of the uh, crossbar. I thought it'd be cool if like when he came out, the silhouette was exactly the symbol and then he could move that capo up to then lock it up at the neck to play, which would have been kind of cool. But, um, you know, I wow. think that, uh, there were a lot of people in that step and I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not claiming, you know, any, any ownership of that at all because I looked at it, I'm like, what else are you going to do with that? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, just kind of, kind of writes itself, you know, like how, how the whole thing is shaped. So, 
Um, right. In the end, I'm sure there were a lot of cooks in that. In that. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet. This is the oh cover. that one yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually cover. have a uh, I don't know if it was a T-shirt that was designed by you or I I, I doubt I, I kind of wish I would remember to actually bring it but there is a caricature of this of the hat with the rose uh, and it's got a symbol behind him uh, on a on a it's a T-shirt that I think I got on Society Five or whatever that place is called. Uh, and it was an independent artist. I didn't look to even see if it was you. I just saw the design. I was like, oh my gosh, it looks fantastic. But it was like a character, also kind of a little bit cartoony version of mm -hmm. Prince on the right. I think I've uh, actually seen that, believe it or not. And it it's wasn't fantastic. me. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, no, I think I've seen it. If I get a tattoo, this is the tattoo that's happening. Well, another oh, tattoo. That's awesome. This is the one that's happening for sure. Tell me about this tour book, because this tour book, I love the friggin' look of this. I love that stark red and black contrast of just the, the photo work and just everything. This is just such a phenomenal piece of work. Thanks. Well, this is this is around the same time that we were doing the, um, uh, what was it, the, um, God, the Exodus album. There we go. Sorry. I just because we were just talking about that. Um, th this is what I was saying with Michael and, and I, we would do it, those keys. Literally, we scanned those keys. We made that symbol out of those keys. We just stretched crap and made it happen. Um, on those handcuffs down there, there's actually both of our, our um, I think there's an SMP in that circle right there, uh, my, my uh, initials. And then on the inside, some of the, um, some of the little film strips. <laughs> We put our initials in there too. We hit them. It was kind of funny, but um, this was just fun. We just again, we we had this compositing software that that was outside of Photoshop, and we just loved using it because it was hard to do otherwise, you know. Um, so a lot of the images inside of the band and everything was you know composites of things, and we just had a good time with it. Um, I, we had a ball, and um, you know, I was really good. You know, since I had a painting background, I was really good at being able to put the things together and all that. But Michael was definitely there, like I. I swear to God, we were just like laughing like little kids sometimes at the stuff we managed to, to sneak in this, this tour book. Yeah, this is just unbelievable. All right, so we're going to go through yeah. some photos. We don't have to stop and really you know, necessarily comment at every single one, but it'd be interesting okay. to kind of hear some of the quick stories behind some of these because I got just, just a bunch of photos. It's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one's really, really cool. It's a black and white photo. Again, this is for the people on the app trying to be a little bit more verbose. Uh, black and white of prints, kind of a little bit of a silhouette. Uh, there's actually more to this photo because I think I've seen two versions of this photo where it's long and you can actually see. All yeah, it's a longer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, tell me about this photo and where this took place. And uh, This was shot during the Greatest Romance uh, video shoot. So he oh, just let right. me walk around and shoot stuff. So that outfit, and, but it was cool because of all the light that was all set up in there. And um, I had a really good, really good time with that. That was fun. Thank you. Man, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just fantastic just seeing all this, all this work. It's just unreal. And some of these photos are just staggering. Again, I don't know what it is I'm drawn to about this look that he has. I love this look, and I love when he leans more towards, or, we, or photography wise, you lean more towards the red and black tones. It just, it just works so well in contrast with him. But tell oh, me yeah. about. So the same thing, this was uh, also Greatest Romance video shoot. What was great was they had like three sets done. They did the kind of one with the water and the black and the strings across it. They had this one, and then they had the one with the little table. Um, uh, it was kind of in the back room of then there was a girl who was dancing in the front room. Um, so it was cool because it was also like having all these built-in sets. So I just had to look for stuff. And so, so what's interesting about this camera was um, it was one of the early, uh, digital cameras and it was a pro pro version, but it was a Kodak, um, digital back on a Nikon, uh, body, um, like an SLR body. And, uh, it had some issues. Like if you didn't have enough light, uh, color was, eh, you know, and so, um, as a matter of fact, I'm working, one of the things I'm working on right now is all my photos I'm putting into a book and, uh, but the interior shots are all going to end up having to go black and white just for continuity, because that was the place that I had the hardest time with was that some of the, some of the color would uh, basically bleed underneath what would be considered the black part. And it just looked soft and kind of mushy. So I'm switching all that over to black and white. And then all my outdoor stuff. And then I have a shoot 
notorious magazine that I did that was actually lit well. So that entire sheet will be in a color in a color book. So just that's that's I'm kind of working on that. That's why when I'm seeing all these shots, I'm like, oh yeah, I turned that black and white. Um, but anyway, um, you know, as to as to the shot, it really like I said, I had the right light here because he had wanted me to go on tour and shoot. And it's like I he he's like, well, try and shoot some pictures of me, you know, playing and moving. So you've seen that? Have you seen the triptych where he's playing guitar? Yes. That I did. Or yeah. Okay. So he st he would stop every time because I told him I said I can't catch you moving fast. So he just you know he'd be he would be playing, but then he just kind of stop in a position and let me shoot, right? Which was great. I got that. But one night he said, "Let's go and see if you can shoot me on stage." So he's got the microphone set up because I've been rehearsing in the back. He gets up there and he starts doing all this stuff. And of course, he's a big blur. And so he looks at me, and again, you know, we're talking four in the morning where you know your your nerves are right here. You don't you don't care what you're gonna say to somebody. And he says to me, um, he goes, oh, looks like you need to stay, you know, learn to stay still. And I said, take a look at the microphone. Microphone is perfectly still. You're the one that's moving. It's the camera, not me. I just remember it now. And I was like, that wasn't too weird, right? You know, but he's like, okay. And so, I mean, you know, sometimes you just got to say what's what. And so, unfortunately, I never had the chance to shoot him live, which I would love to do. I love shooting live photography. I've got a lot of it on my, my website and stuff. And um, I just... Uh, but this was the next best thing because he was doing, he was literally doing all this stuff, but this was lit for video, like a lot of light on it. So I could catch these things, you know, which was yeah. really nice. For, for those who are interested in, in picking up this picture book, I did make it easy for you folks. If you want to purchase Steve's book, you can go to funkatopia.com slash Steve. That's F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A.com slash Steve. And you'll be taken to the Amazon uh, site, so you can actually purchase this book right from there. Uh, so yeah, just got to make it really quick, so you don't have to remember like long weird strings. <laughs> it's <laughs> punkatopia.com slash Steve. Thank you, Jeff Page. Appreciate there it. That. Is right down the bottom. Uh, yeah, so just go there, and you'll be able to. You'll be taken right to it. Uh, another black and white. Yep, that was in um, Marbella. Um, again, this is one of those ones where the colors were really, really wonky, I think, because I was trying to deal with, there was indoor lighting, but it was just low light, and then the outdoor lighting was weird. So turning into black and white was the best way to go about this, but I really liked the way it looked. So um, yeah, this was, uh, we were shooting in the room, there's a piano over here, no, maybe over there, um, and uh, he and my team were sitting at the piano and stuff, and then he just got up and did a few things uh, around the room. and. Yeah, that's kind of how everything was. We didn't um, feel like 90% of what we shot was not intentional to a specific project. It was more that he, he wanted to shoot and get things and then could figure out what to do with them later. Um, so that was kind of interesting because I never knew, you know, like, I mean, when we did the truth, that was very specific. Um, and uh, thank you, Val. Um, but some of this stuff, we were just, Shooting at the house over there, my bed flew me over, and that was, that was a really great shoot, really great hangout too. Because we, uh, oh, ha, I like that one. Um, that's funny because this was going to be for the um, High album. It was going to be on the CD, and so the CD was going to be like he was, uh, the hand would be printed on the CD like he was holding the CD. And that was in my in my um, room upstairs. That can back there is a spray mount can because when we would make a mock-ups of the CDs, we would actually spray mount that to the CD. He'd give us an actual CD and we put it on top, cut it out, and give it to him. Um, so this was just under my lamp, um, like a, my desk lamp, and I just thought that was a really cool picture of his hand. Because, I mean, that yep. hand did a lot of stuff. Piano, uh, drums, you know. Yeah, I just – and you're, you're talking about high, and I actually had taken a uh, – taken a picture of the inside of the book for all the uh, inside of the book you had like i think it was like 12 photos of him uh half naked wearing skin colored pants which was airbrushed to make him look naked with the guitar or whatever that was supposedly yep. according to prince vault going to be the high album cover yes uh, do you um do you remember and a lot, you know, it's, it's always funny because, you know, there's all these pictures of, of Prince naked, uh, like for the high album cover where he wasn't naked and, uh, which we found out, um, we also found out from Gilbert Davison that in love sexy, he was also not naked. Uh, he had on, uh, 
they just airbrushed nudity <laughs> into love sexy mm -hmm. and it's like what oh my god uh so i always think this is really interesting just kind of um you know the ideas that he has and and the, the visions that he has and and how how comfortable you are in those scenarios where you know he what is the most uncomfortable thing that he's ever asked you to shoot where you're like i don't know that i'm i don't know that i want to shoot that is any interest um, in no i mean i you know stuff here's the thing i mean like even today it's like, I mean, I've done, you know, I've done some nudes and things like that. And when I, once I'm working, it's really about what I'm doing. And it's really about seeing the form and the objects and stuff. It, it becomes, it becomes all about the shadow and the light and the, the forms, you know, it, it isn't anything too shocking or too weird. I, I'd say that uh, the only thing that, the only thing that was funny, it wasn't, it wasn't uncomfortable. It was just funny was when we were doing the notorious shoot, he had the, um, what we put on his oh free whatever he wanted free on his stomach and gold paint and uh was it was just funny because yeah story. yeah <laughs> well it was just funny because it was this um you know it was gold paint and like a cup and the guy who was the art director for the magazine was he he came over with this yeah there it is yep right there he came over with it and he's like sticking his finger and get ready to go prince and prince is like no steve's gonna do it i'm like oh okay put my camera down <laughs> <laughs> go over and it was just what was hilarious about the whole thing is it was cold and it was early in the morning too we actually had a really early shoot and um and it, it was cold and so when i was putting it on he's like he's giggling so hard it was hilarious and so i'm like hey stop giggling because you're making me like screw up the thing and i'm, I'm sitting there going like I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to have to come back and do it again. I don't have to wipe it off. He's also like, he was all shiny and stuff. I don't know what he had on, but he had all shiny stuff on. So I'm like, I don't want to have to wipe him down and then whatever, you get himself shiny again before I put the thing on there. So it was just, it was just a funny moment, you know, but it also, it was cool looking back on it. I was like, well, he trusted me quite a bit there just to be like, you know, I'm comfortable with you doing this, not you, you know? that was kind of fun yeah and for those who are who again are listening on the app there's a picture of uh prince and he has this furry jacket on and it's open and he's bare bare chested but across his abs steve had to take gold paint with his fingers and write free on on prince's stomach and i just that was like really surprising to me because obviously you know you got this this lovely woman in the in the photo with him who probably could have done it, but yeah, I, I guess there's like this level of trust that he had to have with you in order to say, "Hey, Steve," because if I'm doing a photo shoot and I'm doing something similar, not that I would be comfortable doing something like that, it would be, "Hey, Jeff, I'm okay with Jeff writing." <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You got, you got your people. You got your people. That was last That's weekend. the way it goes. Last weekend, remember. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Last weekend, that was the whole thing. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. But yeah, that's that's, and you didn't even think twice about it. He said, "Oh, uh, Steve's gonna uh, take this gold paint and he's gonna put free on my stomach," and yep, you didn't just, even think twice. You just went and did yep. it. Put the camera down. Just there you go. Well, it was funny too. Another time that I remembered, um, like like that was um, we were working on the greatest uh, greatest romance video, and um, I had been tasked with. He brought me down. He asked me um, about the what else it might need because it was a lot of red um, on the stages and kind of hanging drapery and everything. I said, well, what about like, you know, uh, burning candles? And he's like, oh, that's a good idea. I said, we need a lot of them because you got a lot of stages. And he goes, well, we could get that. So they start raiding the studios for candles to start with. And then eventually they realize they're going to have to go out and buy some more. And um, the... Uh, the funny thing about that was I'm like, well, I don't have people. He goes, well, all these people that work here, I pay them, right? And I'm like, uh-huh. He goes, so just go get them. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I have to go around like in everybody's office and say, hey, like accounting. Hey, accounting people, can you come help do this? I mean, most of them were cool about it, to be honest. So that, that was all right. But uh, it was just funny. So we're doing that. But I had to go back upstairs because, like I said, I did. I was doing that. But then I had other work he wanted out of me. Like I that, that mm. you know it's just like i still have to get that done so i'm in my office and he comes running in really quick and he's like he just stops and he turns around towards me and he goes like this and i'm like what and i realize his zipper is like halfway up and he can't get it up and i'm like oh okay cool and he's like zip and he just goes running out and i was like oh, that was weird <laughs> just like one of those things you're like okay just you know no context just flies in zip me up and out i go Woo, you know so 
That's awesome. That was pretty interesting. All right, so, I mean, you, you, so you talk about that personal moment, the personal moment of, of writing free on his, on his stomach, any other really moments that are kind of like not intimate, like in a sexual way or anything that are just a little bit more like kind of that you were like, this is kind of borderline, but okay, whatever. <laughs> any other moments like that? Um, no, I mean, I mean, you know, having, having like deep conversations about stuff is always weird, especially oh, yeah. when you, you don't know where that, so one of the things that's interesting is like, you know, a lot of times we'd, we'd be spending time and it would be like, you know, hey, this is like a friend of mine. We're having a conversation, whatever. And then you start working on something and you suddenly realize you're sitting with your boss. Right. And so then you have to deal with like, oh, how far should I go with this conversation that we're having? When I'm suddenly in the position of, of starting to work on something and it starts putting my brain into like, you are my boss. Where is the line? And so I, I think so you had to kind of feel it out with him. Um, I was pretty straightforward with him about most stuff, but I also, I learned how to say things that were effective to communicate um, whatever I needed to communicate with him. So he didn't come back, it, it didn't come at him weird. So he wasn't reacting to the way I communicated it, but what I communicated. Um, one, of the, one of the stories was um, in my book is about the camel uh do you remember that story at all it was the, it was the one where they were shooting a get wild commercial and um i had the producer came up to my office now my office was funny people oh, yeah. come to my office all the time because it was like the only room that had a light on all the time because i was always in my room I mean, most of the time anyway and um she came in and she's like i don't know what to do i'm like what but like, i don't even know quite who you are. i think i met you earlier maybe for a little while and um she's like he wants a camel i said Oh, it wants a camel for this commercial. I don't know how we're going to get a camel. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know what to tell you here. I am not, I, I do not have camel knowledge. <laughs> you know? I, I don't have the hookup for a camel. So Who's she that? leaves. <clears throat> right, right. Especially, it was like two in the morning or something like that, right? So maybe it's one. I think it was one. And there's a reason why I can remember what's wrong. That's one. So the next, like 10 minutes later, he shows up. And he's like, um, do you know where you can get a camel? And I said, um, I said, well, it's, and I did one of these things where I'm like, well, it's, I don't even have a watch on, right? I was like, well, it's one o'clock. So in Minneapolis, I don't think we could get one. I said, now LA is a little earlier. Maybe we could do that, but then we'd have the trouble of flying it in and we'd probably have to get a helicopter or something. And as soon as I started explaining, like, this is how we could do it possibly. He's like, oh, okay, fine. And he just leaves. That's it. You know, like, but sometimes that was it. Like you just started to explain it and then go, okay, let's go down some crazy paths. Maybe a helicopter could fly this thing in. And and then it starts to, I think it starts to occur to him like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's not really very feasible, you know, but um, better well, that than trying to explain why the camera's not doing what we want. You know, it's like, that doesn't work. So. And the end of that story is it it became a tiger, if I remember this. Yes, story. yes, a mountain lion, mountain lion, yeah, mountain lion. which was hilarious because I got a call from Danny Saltis, who was a uh, building manager. He's like, he he called me up and he's like, hey, Steve, come down to the front. I'm like, all right, cool. I come down and I'm like, oh look, there's a mountain lion on the on the desk, and I just go over and I start petting it, and then and I got a I got a photo somewhere of me with it, right? And later I was like, that, that was really weird. A, there was a mountain lion down there. B, I didn't even think I shouldn't pet a mountain lion. You know, like I had no fear because I'm so late. I was just like, okay, this mountain lion must be cool with this sitting here on this desk. I was petting it. You know, so oh my God. That, this that is very interesting. interesting. Steve Park, the great mountain lion whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was probably, it was probably, uh, yeah, it probably was basically, you know, you're very chill, dude, because you're really tired. So I'm good. Scuba diving. I think yeah. Scuba diving. Mr. B King, you talk about scuba diving with Prince. I was like, I don't remember that story at all. No, 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 no. I mean, he was in the pool, and I was like trying not to fall in and not let the camera fall in. That's about all I had. <laughs> yeah, actually, and actually, if I look at, um, let's see if I can pull up some of these photos here uh, from the pool stuff. There's some photos in here that I, I'd never seen before. Some of them that I had actually found online. Um, well, first off, before we get to the pool stuff. This I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right out of the gate. I am really partial to obviously the other one where he's off to the side and it kind of had that China red white that photo that we mm -hmm. started with. Um, 
that's one of my favorite photos but this is probably out of all the photos this is probably one of my all-time mm. favorite photos um and i don't know what the i mean can you talk about this photo at all yeah yeah that was one of the first photos i shot <laughs> what? This, is unbelievable. This, this is like a shot that you just like that this takes like mastery it's just and and unfortunately because it, this is from icongallery.com they've got their watermark on here but and i think the photo if i remember correctly is a, is a, is a little bit wider so you can actually see his fingertips and stuff and and the a little actual... bit not his fingertips but a little further out yeah 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 um, I this just photo. did, by the way, I just did a 40 by 60 reproduction of that for somebody. Oh, my God. How yeah, I, um, I, I need to get one for my wall. I don't have any room, yeah. but I got to figure it out. I love this photo. Yeah. Uh, well, so that was one of the first ones I shot. And so I, you know, we walk in and it's like he, he wanted to use that 10, a 10K movie light because my first try at shooting with the camera was using um, strobes. But I never used them before. So I, did, I wanted it to just put out enough light for the photo to come out. That's all I wanted. And uh, he looked at them and thought they were kind of just very flat. Well, of course they were because I didn't set anything off to the side. I didn't do any bounces. I didn't do all the stuff I know how to do now because I've never done it before. So he said, um, we have a 10K movie light. We'll bring that in. And so that's what we ended up using for a lot of these shots, which is not great having one source of light for most things because you do get a lot of harsh shadows and stuff. But they can be cool too. Like in black and white, it looks really good. Um, but also I happened to have a wide angle lens. I had different lenses and, um, and so we shot this and, and he loved it. He absolutely loved it. Um, it's funny because that's what I think makes this cool is it, that we used a wide angle because with him, I have not seen a lot of photographers ever get to use a, like a distortion lens with him. And I think that's because he probably overall would not want that. It made this one work, but in general, it would not work. So I was very lucky to get to do that. And then he wanted me to do a, a Hannah treatment on his hand, which I did in Photoshop. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, in Hannah, somebody was asking, are those Hannah hand tattoos? And, and yes, obviously they are. I mean, because Hannah does not come off for like days and sometimes weeks. So did, did he walk around with these Hannah tattoos or did he figure out a way to get it off? Photoshop. Yeah, he said that's all for, I missed that when you said I was like staring into this photo and you probably said it. But... <laughs> Fortunately for me, I'd seen him with tattoos done before, so you know I had a pretty good idea of how they look. There's that etch a sketch brain at work again. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, he said Photoshop. I got it. All right. Uh, Andre also asked what you thought about AI art. You're gonna have to rewind, Andre. We already talked about AI. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. We're, not, we're not gonna talk about that again. Uh, the photos that I was talking about before were some of these photos that the pool stuff that you were talking about, but I realized that I had not seen this one of, of, of him in the pool with my I, I, this is really weird. Wow. I'd never, I'd never seen this photo. <laughs> wow. This is, it, which is really, really cool. So tell me about the photo shoot for, for this pool, the pool uh, scenes here. Well, the whole, the whole shoot, um, as I said, we were in Marbella and um, the light, I got to say, the light there was incredible. Like it was diffused somehow. They, so the, the property, there's a cliff, like you can look over and see the ocean. So I think, I feel like maybe there was a lot of uh, water particles in the air. So it kind of diffused the light a little bit. Um, that's my best guess. Um, but yeah, we just, he's he came out wearing, you know, the tank top thing and, and a little, uh pool shorts and got in and said oh let's take some pictures i mean like like we always do that was kind of it we just started started rolling it and um he uh, and my take got it with him and and they just did some shots together i think i have a couple more similar to this and uh that was it yeah oh yeah that one that, that was an early one too that was in 97 that was the same time i did the the guitar and playing the guitar the um the one where he's playing the piano that looks like it's a phantom of the opera um organ because it was we we rented that from um the chanhassen dinner theater up the street yeah and i think so, a lot of yeah, the that really next oh, so that shot by the way the one the one bag that you just saw the funniest thing was for the longest time i had this great shot he so maite had some people come in to for, for hair real quick and he stepped back and uh he's like looking at me and he's like like this like don't tell her don't tell her and he just sits there and he's like 
behind her. He's doing like all these goofy poses and goofy smiles and I'm shooting. And he <laughs> loved one of them. It was hilarious. Um, and it sat for a long time on the hard drive. Now keep in mind, you know, those computer hard drives had not a lot of space on them back in the day. So you had to take stuff <laughs> off, store it or whatever. And so every once in a while he'd see on my desktop, he's like, what's that photo? And I click it and he'd look at it and go like, oh, okay, we can keep that one. I'm like, oh, what? I didn't even know these were in jeopardy of being erased. That was the one I had on the desktop. And I wish I wish I had, because he said it was cool to keep. But then in a moment he looked at it and, and you know, it was Tuesday and he just decided that was not the day he liked it anymore, and, you know, trashing it. And, you know, which is a shame because it was really funny. Because he was a fun, he was a very funny guy, do very funny stuff. And but uh, rarely did that was that something we did in photos. So that's why I was so pleased that he let let that one fly, and then he eventually wow. trashed. That's it's funny you were talking about the the computer storage and everything. I still remember going to the computer store back in I don't know it was late nineties, early two thousands, and picking up a three hundred and fifty meg, not gig. 350 meg hard drive at the time it was like $80 and I remember trying to convince my wife I was like it'll never be this low again yeah <laughs> it's no, like when you think no. about the size of hard drives now yeah. and I had one of those I was trying to find this old camera that I have and you may have actually had one where it is actually a camera that you put a floppy disk it was a Sony and you put a floppy disk inside of it and it oh, was I actually, do remember those I didn't have that one the one so the one we had, I still have the one that we shot all these photos with, um, and it had a, a drive that like, okay, so like this one right here, for example, uh, it's uh, 75, 75 gigabytes. I mean, no, 75, yeah, 75 gigabytes, oh, wow. this little thing, right? But the things before were like this big, and they were like, they, you could photo, you could shoot like 15 to 18 photos on, and it was a little hard drive. You could actually hear it spinning up inside. It was like crazy. It was crazy. I still have that too. I mean, I don't know if that camera would ever work again. Still, so. nuts. I'm gonna put this one back up because this one's a, a oh, favorite yeah. to a lot of people. Yep. This is obviously two different shots of of uh, Prince and Maite in bed. One yep. one of them, she actually looks like she's actually asleep. <laughs> oh, they. So, just, just yeah, I don't know how long this on. this shot was, she went on, but uh, a lot of people love. So, yeah. So this this shoot now. See the the. The shot on the left, we cleaned it up. Uh, the shot on the right is actually how it looked because it's actually a mirror above the bed. So you can see the line on the right one um, that that belies kind of how it was shot. Because people are like, did you get on the ladder? I say, no, I just shut up and do it. I mean, I don't care. I'll tell you how I did it. Uh, it's, now, let me tell you, just because I shot it in a mirror over the bed did not make it easy, by the way. Just, just saying. Um, what I love about the left one is that Mia had crawled up on the bed and she just decided it was time to go to sleep. She was great. She was, fell asleep mm. there at the bottom. Um, but then the other thing that's funny is if you'll notice that they have um, each other's uh, pajama bottoms on. So like if you look at Maite's uh, sleeve, it's got little ruffles and his leg has little ruffles. And then he's got the straight sleeve on his top shirt and then she's got the straight on the, on the other pair. So they had, they had uh, did not yeah, notice so that. <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's yeah, pretty yeah. awesome. Uh, all right, let's go to the, this one is kind of obviously got a little bit of um uh, a little bit of story behind it, obviously. The, these oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Just because of the reasoning why the playground was there in the first place and just some of the things that um, had to be going through his mind. Um, again, for the people that are on the app, I've got photos up here of Prince being shot on a playground. If I remember the story in the book correctly, um, I can't really tell. You can't really tell this is. Uh, is this the one that's on that was on the Paisley Park property? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And so the playground was put up, obviously, you know, in 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 hopes, you know, that his child would play on it. And so now mm -hmm. it's just kind of it kind of served a little bit as a as a reminder of. So kind of, can you kind of get we kind of get into the headspace of these photos because it just kind of looks like it's a regular photo shoot, but when you look at, when you consider everything that was kind of going on in the background, it's it's a lot. Our context, yeah. Um, well, we had shot. Um, the uh the outfit that he's wearing on the left hand side uh, on the swing we had shot in the near the pond in the back the little swampy area in the back so i've got these images of him like now if you've seen any but he's kind of behind or in in these like big tall red fern looking things um kind of back in them and then kind of back out the story i was telling about that was i kept telling him to back up in, as far as i was trying to get him to back up as far as he could, felt comfortable going in until i Suddenly, heard his heel go squish, and then I'm like, "Yep, that's good," because <laughs> I didn't want him to go too far. 
Um, but we had just shot back there. We'd also shot the um, shots of him with the gold boots, and he was in the, the big wooden chair out in the grass um, in kind of a long robe type of thing. Um, we shot that on the other side of Paisley, like around the back. And then um, then we came around, if I remember, this was on the other, around the side. Um, and uh, yeah, he just, he kind of started getting up in there. Like um, some of the shots, he's up in the actual, um, like where the window is and all that kind of stuff. Now these were, I'm trying to think. This, the one on the right though, I think was a, a different day because I don't think he went in and got his hair done between this look and the braids. So I think that was a, a separate day that we came back out there um, and shot because he got up in it into the big bubble and everything like that. Um, he, the one on the left, he definitely had a little more of a, I don't know, a little more serious air that day in general. I mean, I, I think it was a general vibe and I think it, I don't know. He yeah. didn't, I, I don't feel like he like, there was anything like, weighing super heavily on him but but he definitely was a little more I don't know, a little more serious about it um there was also some shots of my take came out there with him and they were playing on the swings together so that was a little more of a light-hearted moment than kind of what you see in the shots but i don't have that stuff of course <laughs> um the basketball the, the one on the right uh he also had his basketball and was, was yeah. doing all kinds of stuff with his basketball and stuff like that now when i just felt like he was he was definitely like working that, you know, new power generation top because he was showing the back of it and the front of it and stuff like that. So it's um the tough thing with him is like when he gets in front of the camera, um, catching him being natural is tough because he's he's immediately starts to notice that the camera's there. And so he's doing things for the camera. Um, you know, I mean, there can always be subtext, I suppose, you know, in how someone looks. Uh, there's a shot I took of him on the uh, Greatest Romance video set where he was talking to me and I, I stopped shooting and he said, no, you keep shooting. I'm like, all right, cool. That, that's where I really caught him feeling very natural because um, one of the bits he was telling me about was how, how much stress it was for him doing these videos and the responsibility he feels to all these people who's, you know, he realizes sometimes like I'm responsible for, you know, the money they take home to feed their kids, to pay their mortgages, to do all this stuff. And he said, some days it really is hard. And um, there's a, this is one of the shots in particular I got of him where I had written with that shot was when he was talking to me about it. And I felt like that captured a very genuine moment of just, you know, conversation uh, versus him, you know, sort of being, being, you know, Prince. But the thing that's interesting about that is I, I still look back at my stuff and sometimes because, you know, I'm my own worst critic, of course. I look at right. people like Alan Bolio, I look at Jeff Katz, I look at those guys, I'm like, oh, I wish I had all those sets and all that light. Nah. But then I start to recognize that my work does feel more intimate because it was just the two of us. Like, we didn't have uh, people around us. We didn't have, like, sets for the most part. You know, every once in a while we did, but most of the time we didn't. Um, it was just, say, grab your camera, we'd go out and we'd shoot. And um, so I think that's what makes it feel that's what gives my stuff the feel that it has relative to other people. So I, I, once I sort of landed on that, I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. I'm, I'm happy about that. You know? So Man. let's run to real, real quick. Cause I don't want to keep it too much longer. I'm sorry. I, thank you for staying for this long. This is fantastic. Uh, Cause I just love admiring your work and everything that you've done and, and the breadth of work that you have, you know, over these decades has just been, it's just staggering. So there's a lot to cover and and it's just like, man, we could go on easily for like a long time, but I, I just, I don't want to do that to you because I think I got family, but I, there's a couple pieces that I do want to hit on uh, that aren't really Prince related. Um, for instance, the, the, the shirt you did with David Bowie. Talk about this for a second. So that was a tour shirt uh, for David Bowie, same company that um, hired me to do uh, the shirts for Prince, um, Brockham International. Um, so this was one they, they, uh, saw that I could do stuff that made Prince happy. So they're like, let's try you with David Bowie. So I just really got into like what, so one of the things I try to look at when I'm doing work for an artist and for the fans really is what I look at it for the fans. What would they recognize? What would they like to see? And I'm really, I'm a big Gustav Klimt fan. So I kind of like some of the vibe of that, you know, type of stuff in here, but you know, first thing they want to see, they want to see the guy, but then all these little uh, nods to 
various albums in different time periods of, of his work because this was the Sound and Vision tour uh, was what I really wanted to go after here. Um, so that was pretty much it. You know, I, I picked a style that I liked and I just, you know, like I said, I, I tried to weave things in there that the fan would be like, oh, that's from this and that's from this and that's from that and all that. So, yeah. That's how I thought about it. I did that. I mean, honestly, that's how, how I thought about, you know, like I said, I was a huge Prince fan growing up. So when I got to do the Love Sexy Tour shirt with those four different, you know, types of styles, I'm just like, ooh, I would buy that, <laughs> you know? So that's why I made it because I would, I would totally wear that, you know? What is the significance of the white cutout? Is there any significance? Uh, cut well, th that's where the T-shirt would be. So it was on a black T-shirt. So that was just the, the, so that would be on a black T-shirt. Well, I was more interested in just like the the shape of it. Like I, I, you know, the the top right's kind of uh, curled up, and just it just kind of looks like there was something going on other than artistic notion. I don't know. I just liked it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that with me. It's like I just thought that was a cool shape. You know, that's the answer then. <laughs> uh, this is uh, our good friend Victor Wooten, uh, yeah. very active Funkatopian. He is in and out of Funkatopia on Facebook quite a bit. Again, we had the Wooten brothers on here. Uh, it was a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, love this guy, but I love this photo too. But the other thing I found really interesting, two stories here, uh, that you talked Victor Wooten into selling posters, which he didn't think would sell. And the second thing that I found very, very interesting uh, in the story of Victor Wooten is that you actually sang on a Victor Wooten album. So yeah. can we talk about those two stories real quick. Sure, sure. Well, with Victor, um, so I met Victor in 2000, when did I meet him? 2005. Um, I actually went to see um, uh, Maceo Parker. He was playing a festival with, um, I think the Flectones were playing. I really wanted to meet Victor um, because I had shared Victor's uh, music with, with Prince. And um, so I thought it was really cool to, um, to get to meet him and, and tell some stories and all that stuff. And uh, so yeah, we met and we got into just got into a good friendship. And I said, hey, you know, when you're in town, we could do some photos. Sure. So we did. And then um, he was telling me about this album Soul Circus he was going to do. I'm like, I got a great idea. Let's do like a freak show poster with you with all these arms. And he's like, cool. And I did that. And so I, I, I've worked for him since then um, on pretty much every solo record he's put out, which has been great. And he's let me come up with like titles for the records and stuff like that, which has been fun. And so it's really, he's a, he's a great guy. He, he, he is one of those people that is so genuine and just so down to earth. And he really wants input he and he likes being involved he's like i got an idea cool bring me the idea we'll talk about it and then we talk about it and then we you know like we'll do his idea and then i, I come up with another idea what we're doing we'll do my idea and, um yeah it's really fantastic so um uh so the question was about the poster so i i'm just like you know this dude is like you know internationally known as one of the best bass players on the face of the planet and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, you need to have some posters. And I said, remember when you were a kid, you want a poster? He goes, man, who's going to buy a poster of me? I'm like, are you kidding? Of course they're going to buy a poster of you. And so we went through this first run. And he was like, oh, my God, I sold them all out. I said, well, get some more. So we did. <laughs> and he sold those out, you know. That's so, awesome. Um, I, think, I think he – but a lot of people, like, I mean, a lot of people have that. Like, you know, he's a musician. It's what he loves to do. He loves to play music. And, you know, he knows how to put on a show. But, but having this sort of like, oh – people want to take me home with them in a, in a sense, like, you know, visually um, to some extent is not necessarily the way everybody thinks, you know, uh, right. uh, Prince was very much like a, like he knew image was important and he, he expressed himself through his image a lot. And so he brought different things to the table with every, everything, you know, Victor doesn't go out of his way to do that. I mean, he's got his, his vibes and his things he does, but I don't think he necessarily felt that was like a selling point for him, but you know, I changed his mind, which was nice. Um, that's, so that's the answer to the poster question. What was the next? What was the other question? Uh, I, oh, I think you answer. Oh, you sang on his. Uh, oh, that's right. You sang on his album. Yeah, words and tones. One of the two records. It was just a little thing. I because so I told him. He used to be in bands and stuff. I said, you know, grew up with Earth, Wind, and Fire. I was I was a tenor in chorale, so we would we would all see who could hit the high from the Bailey notes. And back then we could do that. <laughs> so he said to me, he just goes, he just goes, hey. You told me you could sing like Philip Bailey. You want to do it? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I want you to sing, just sing this little part on my record. I'm like, okay. So I did it two takes, and he he tracked them over top of each other so they'd fill in where the, you know, if anything wasn't right, and that was it. So it was really fun. I'm just like, I'm not again. I'm not going to say no. 
You know, I mean, I could have been all like, oh, no, no, I'll do it. Sure, why not? And if you hate it, then you don't have to do it. So. Very cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's very cool. I love these two shots, obviously, with, with Shaka Khan and uh, Larry Graham. Uh, the story I'm interested in hearing, which I have, don't think I've ever heard, was the shot of Larry in the in the elevator and oh. how this all pay, played out. Because every one of us has been in an elevator where, you know, it's always opening. There's always moving. There's always movement. You never know what's going to happen or who's going to come in and whatever. So what is the, the story behind this? Because to capture a shot like this is uh got to have its own set of challenges <laughs> it does um so the, we we saw uh went to see uh larry at um a funk festival in columbia maryland and uh after the show um you know larry said hey do you want to shoot and i said sure let's shoot and so we went back to the hotel and so we're in the hotel and it's it's very late and my son is with me and he's you know he's huge larry fan i mean he, he actually listened to all that music and knew all the words and everything and um, so we were shooting in the hotel. They had like a suite in this big room and the whole band is in there. And I'm shooting all these up shots and I'm doing all this stuff. We went outside in front of the hotel and had him sitting out there with just the overhead lights. We did that. And then when we were going back up this time, I saw him and he literally was just getting ready to push the button. And I said, hold it. Click. And that is exactly what came out. And uh, the funniest wow. shot I have, though, is the whole band, right? Larry's on top of like the little low, you know, low, uh, coffee table. He's standing on that. The band's all around him and everything. And in and I've got all my lights. You can see my lights and stuff, which I would crop out or whatever, Photoshop them out. But my son is sitting in the background on the edge of the couch, looking so tired. He's just like trying really hard to stay awake and stuff. It's it's really really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and of course, we you, the shot con photo is it is what it is. I, I know you've you've done some shots with her, and and she's just seems like one of the easiest people to be able to shoot. <laughs> she was funny too because she she we did the shoot she took forever getting her makeup on which is fine i mean i don't i don't mind i was just i didn't realize if i realized it i would have gone down other stuff because like i said i've always had something to do with paisley that didn't involve waiting for things right <clears throat> so she came out she looked great we shot we looked at all the photos i said so what do you think she's like oh those all look really great i said then we're done she's like really and i said really she goes I spent more time getting makeup on than we took shooting. And I said, do you want to shoot more? She goes, no, no, I'm good. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was just funny. She acknowledged that it took a long time. Uh, and she was great. She was like super nice. Oh, Wendy and Lisa. Oh, Wendy that. and Lisa. I love these girls. Okay. And let me just go ahead and say that, I mean, I have seen, I have seen that account, the music by Wendy and Lisa uh, come into this chat room, not say anything, just kind of, you know, be there in the vibe. Nobody called them out. I don't think anybody even noticed. I know they know. I have been trying to get Wendy and or Lisa or Wendy and Lisa on this show for years. I love, love, love them. Have nothing but mad respect for them. I am so in the Wendy and Lisa camp. Have every single one of their albums. I worship Wendy and Lisa. I would love to have them on the show. So I love the fact that you actually were able to to, to capture them. Um, because I just think they're just, they're musical geniuses. And I just, I just, I don't, I don't get why they don't have, you know, more appreciation, especially for their solo stuff. Because when you look at, I mean, just everything that they do, I mean, Eroico is probably one of my all time favorite albums, obviously Fruit yep, at the Bottom. And all that stuff. Girl yep. Brothers is fantastic, but yep. something about Eroica with like Why Wait for Heaven and all that stuff is just like, it was just next level. Really? Stuff. Yes. Um, I so, uh, I, I love, I love that you got an opportunity to shoot Wendy and Lisa and there's a couple, there's, there's a couple photos here, but this photo is the one I'm more, I would love, I love to hear the story behind, uh, this one. I, I need to hear the story uh, of this one. So this shoot as a whole, uh, if you, if you go back for a second, the left hand, um, shot, uh, with them standing and being all these different people is for the heroes soundtrack cover. Right. So they're being yeah. all the different characters from heroes. And so I got to use the same key art in the background as the actual posters that they did for heroes. And then the shoot, shoot to the right is also from this session. Um, and so then if you go forward, this was, um, we were going to do like a bunch of ideas based on heroes. And so this was one of the ones I came up with. We didn't end up using this one for anything, but I really loved the way it came out. It was, it was so much fun um, to to shoot and then Photoshop together. So the background was from the heroes because they gave me background sets and things from the heroes um, archive. 
uh, to be able to do this. So that was really cool. And I, I mess around in Photoshop a lot. How and and sometimes when you especially when you place an object on a on a background that's got certain lighting or certain vibe to it, it can be a nightmare matching the U and the saturation and everything to kind of match what's going on. How difficult was this uh shot obviously to to match with what's going on with because it even seems like with the flames and the way that they kind of got the reflections on their faces and everything, just how I, I can't even imagine how long this took to kind of put together. I mean, well, the upside, the upside of all of these were that I got these key shot, these key art shots ahead of time, little, little photos on them, like on a, you know, printed out. So at least when I set them up, I kind of said, okay, here's where I want you guys to be. I can see where the light's coming from. So I could set up the light a little bit when I was putting them together. But the, the big, honestly, the big, thing I have going for me is that I used to paint. So none of this stuff was possible before I had to actually paint all of it. So the fact that all I have to do now is take two people and put them into a room and then add a little bit of color here and there and stuff like that is remarkably easier than painting the entire thing. Yeah. So that's really what it comes down to, um, you know, is I, is I had that skill, you know, doing like photorealistic painting. Um, so it translates very easily into Photoshop, as you can imagine. And I, you know, I use a tap pen, pen tool and a tablet. And so that's, um, that's how it wow. All right. Only, only a few more. I want to talk about this. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah that I was so much about... fun when they, when they came to me. Oh. All right. So, so yeah, tell, tell me about this, this Prince, it we're, we're again, for the people on the app, I am so sorry. This is a very, very visual show tonight. Uh, but we're looking at the Prince comic book and the three chains, three of, chains gold, of gold Prince comic book. and i don't know if you knew this or not but a copy of this comic book this picture is actually from rr auctions which has kind of been popping up a lot for prince memorabilia his from his wardrobe and touring and i don't know where they're getting a lot of this stuff i imagine fashion designers and whatever else but a copy of this comic book just sold for 989 dollars it's almost a thousand dollars for this copy. Okay. So if you've got like a box of these, uh, there's your son's college money right there. To I, I, I don't, but you know what I do have? I have that cover. I have the original painting of that cover. Wow. So, well, still got that. And I also have this, which is really fun. I'll take this off the wall, put it back on the wall tomorrow. This is the guy who did the interior art actually gifted me with a panel of the original artwork. I'll I'll this. I'm, I'm going to make you, yeah, make you larger. So look at that. Wow. Oh. Isn't that fun? Look at the band back there. You can tell who everybody is. Isn't that fun? Yeah. So I was so excited when he gave that to me. I was like, damn, dude, thank you. That is, that is friggin' awesome for sure. Yeah. So yeah, this whole comic book thing. I mean, how involved were you in a lot of the inner panels and whatnot? Because just you know, honestly, for me, it was just the cover. Um, and I got, I got asked, um, Gilbert Davidson asked me, he said, Hey, would you like to do a Prince comic book cover? I'm like, would I? <laughs> because, you know, I grew, I grew up on comics and I loved, I loved comics. Um, I was never a person who could do this. I mean, I could, but it would take me forever. And I know the guys that do these panels, they can move very quickly through it. And it's just not my skill set. Um, I've done uh, comics. The comics I've done have been, well, graphic novels, actually. They've all been photographic. So it's the same concept, but doing it photographically instead. So to do a cover, though, is more of a straight up illustration. So I really had a good time uh, putting that together and, and really had fun with some of the color and things like that. There's a lot of uh, really vibrant color in that. I will pull it up for you right now. I'm pulling it up as you guys can see. So you don't think I'm making wow. it up. This is our right, sold. I'm sorry. I, I was off on the $969 is what it wow. sold for. So all I can tell you, if you folks actually have a decent copy, uh, well, this was also was signed by you too. Uh, but yeah. So if you have a copy of this and you happen to see Steve, bring it to the celebration because Steve is always running I'll around. Prisons. He'll sign it and you might be able to sell it for a thousand dollars or you can keep it if you are really we'll split it. <laughs> we'll split it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. And speaking of some of the um some of the graphic work, I also found this eye paparazzi. Oh, yeah. paparazzi. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very cool. Um this is uh, tell me about this eye paparazzi because I, I happen to see some of this and some there's actually some other photos that are inside of this eye paparazzi book that I could not display here on the show. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about so uh, this one. 
this was the first book I did. The first thing I did outside of working for Prince, I, I got into this um, comic through Vertigo, which is part of DC Comics. And um, we did this book. Um, I did it with a photographer named Stephen John Phillips, who shot the main photography. But he shot everything on film, so I had to scan all of this stuff and then Photoshop it all together um, to follow the <clears throat> how the panels were laid out. So this was my first one I did. And then after this, um, I also did one called In the Shadow of Edgar Allan Poe, which I worked on with a friend of mine who wrote it. And then I ended up photographing that one, that whole, that whole um, book and putting most of that together. And then since then, I've also done one called Medusa's Daughter, um, which is also a photographic novel as well. So, but that was an independent project that unfortunately the people we signed up with for distribution were not great. So, well, but this book did pretty well. And I think in the shadow of the girl and did quite well. Um, I, they're hard to find. So. Yeah, they're very hard to find. I, I was trying to find one that was actually on, um, I, I didn't, I couldn't find one on eBay or anything, but it's funny that you brought up Poe because, uh, you had this gone daddy gone collection, which I have not been able to, mm -hmm. you want to talk about something that's difficult to find this, um, for whatever reason, I couldn't find it. I don't know where it might be sold, but I, out of all the images that you have that are represented here, I pulled one of Star Wars and one of Poe. <laughs> so, which is very well, interesting. The, uh, the uh, Gone Daddy Gone, just so you know, you can get that from me. I have those posters. So. Oh, very cool. So this, so this isn't a book. This is actually just a poster. No, no, no. This is a big, this is a big poster. Actually, that that Gone Daddy Gone is big. It's like really big. So uh, it's just a bunch of, so, so how all this came about was, um, it sounds like a sad story, but it's not in the long run. Um, when my, my ex and I split up, um, I found myself with a lot of time on my hands and I didn't know what to do with it. And it was, it was a little rough at the time. Things are great now. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it anymore, but uh, so I just didn't sleep. So I sat up and I'm like, what can I do? I like drawing musicians, but I don't want to do anything that's super complicated. I want something that's relaxing. Um, and all that. And I remembered I had done a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young tour shirt that was like a woodcut look. And it was all pen and ink back then. And I thought, you know, that was fun. I enjoyed doing that. Maybe I'll just start doing that. And of course, I got into um, a Painter, which is uh, Corel, I think, has that now, and a Wacom tablet. And they have tools that mimic natural media tools, including a, um, basically something with a very, you know, kind of hard pen edge to it. And so I started doing these and for me it was very relaxing because you're making a lot of cut lines and you know broad bold strokes it's not about tiny tiny detail and so um that kind of just got me through that because i do i was doing one to two of these at night i forgot like 400 or 500 of these things at this point um just because that was it was just something to do just to keep my mind off of kind of what was going on in my life at the time and then i decided like oh star wars would be fun to do and then uh the edgar Allan poe one which has the entire text of the raven i you know hand wrote all of that behind him um, it's kind of hilarious actually down at the, the very end it starts getting really really really, really tiny because i started running out of room and i'm like i'm not going to start over <laughs> Just keep going. So, uh, yeah but uh, that's uh, kind of story behind those yeah that's pretty awesome well let me just say for those who are interested uh the book is called picturing prince you can also get if you're if you're interested in the sketch work that he's done with gone daddy gone you can go to his website which is steve uh steve at stevepark.com or of course you can find me all over facebook that's the easiest way to catch up with me yeah, yeah so stevepark.com and you can get you know the gone daddy gone poster and whatnot and you can reach him at steve at stevepark.com or you can harass him on facebook like i did uh <laughs> <laughs> it was not get, harassing yeah i know i i was just like well, he, I was kind of like my, my daughter always says, you left me on red. And, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the only thing that's tough sometimes is like when I get mired in projects, it's hard to get back to people sometimes. Cause I'm like, you know, again, it's that you're right in it. And it's like, I want to get back to you, but I don't know what to tell you. And I won't know what to tell you until this is finished. You know, that's what happens with me a lot of times. All right. We will actually, uh, people in the chat area and there's a lot of you let me know who does not have this picturing prince book uh if you have it let's let's try to get somebody who will who, to win this book um who does not have it you don't need a second copy uh but if you if you don't have it let me know and we will and we'll you know, maybe we'll, we'll pick a name and we'll get you get you a book we'll get you a book shipped out uh we'll talk about this after after steve is already gone but if you want the book 
you want to grab a copy, just go to Funkatopia.com slash Steve. That will take you right to the Amazon page where you can actually uh, purchase it. And it's right there. You can actually get it. Steve, Park, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing all these stories. And there was tons of stuff. I mean, Jeff Page can tell you that there was tons of bullets and stuff that I had on here that, that I've skipped. Uh, I wanted to talk about the bro hug. Uh, I wanted to talk about Prince's wig. Uh, the bro hug one I I I really wanted to touch on because uh, Prince was talking about uh, just not to steal your thunder with the story, but that Prince was saying that he loved the fact that people were doing the bro hug now, where you kind of bring it in and, and give a quick hug instead of shaking because he had to play with the guitar hand. Because yep. the first time that I met Prince in Atlanta and I got to stand in front of him and tell him how much his music meant to me, he gave me a bro hug, and so that's the reason I was like. I'll, I'll always remember that bro hug. <laughs> yep, like, yep. Yes. Not the bro hug. But before yep. you go, <laughs> do share the story of the Prince wig. There was something, something that had to be reshot because he had to wear a wig. Oh, 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 oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now here's the thing. Cause yeah, cause I'm gonna tell you, I'll be honest with you too. Um, so I put two stories together. Um, one of them, there really was a wig. But I, I can I, I mistook two different conversations, one with Earl, who was his hairdresser, who was talking about the raspberry beret haircut being what it was because he had um, dyed, bleached his hair and did like a straight up, um, like a spiky thing, sort of like around the world in the day. Um, mm -hmm. But the apparently the um, bleach started breaking his hair. So they had to do what they could for raspberry beret, which is why that look was. So that was one story. The other story completely separate, even though I put them together accidentally in my book, because that's how brains work sometimes, um, was that we were watching the um, uh, purple medley that he was doing the video. He, can't, he called me up to, to watch it because he'd been working on it all day and it was nice. Again, he wanted to share it with me as I was trying to sneak out and go back to my hotel and get sleep. It was hilarious. I'm like, I'm literally like trying to hug the wall. And he's like, Steve. And I'm like, uh, he was upstairs. And I'm just like, yes, he goes, come see this. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. So I come up and uh, he was talking about uh, watching the whole thing. Purple Rain comes up and then he comes on the motorcycle and he pulls up on the motorcycle to Apollonia, I guess. And he, he does that get on thing or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think that was it. And uh, he's like, ah, I started laughing. And I'm like, oh my God, that wig, that wig. And I'm like, what? And then I found out that they had wrapped the primary shooting and he had cut his hair. Now, probably not that short, you know, not as short as, you know, raspberry rare or whatever, but he cut it shorter. And so they had to actually make him a wig to match what he had been wearing for reshoots because they wow. hadn't counted on that, you know? So he thought, oh, we're done. And he went and got his haircut, you know? So, yeah. But I had accidentally put the two together that it was because of the, the bleach blonde hair, but that was later. So um, anyway, so now you know my secret, my dirty secret. I, I mashed up two things together. Oh my God. So, we, 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 we've never gone into a second printing, so I haven't had to go back and uh, retract that bit. Well, that's all right. We always get the scoop here anyways. We would have got it. That's out right. Here. You got the exclusive. That's right. <laughs> Steve Park, thank you so, so much for joining us again. Funkatopia.com slash Steve to pick up this book, uh, Picturing Prince. And of course, with Jeff Page will pick out a name from the people that said they do not have it. And we'll make sure we get a, a book out to, to one of those fine folks. Thank you so, so much for your time and being so generous with My your pleasure. time. That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. We will Thanks, talk. Thanks, shortly. Jeff. <laughs> yep, right, absolutely. Steve, thank you so much All right, take care. Good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. That was Steve Park. If you missed any of it, we will make sure. A lot of people always want to know, you know, why we do that break where we pull ourselves down uh, before we start at the eight o'clock hour. And that specifically is for editing purposes. Because then when YouTube posts it, I post it or whatever, I can just download the video. I can just cut it off right where we restart the intro and that's it. That's it. That's all there's to it. Um, yeah, it is. So that's one of the reasons why I do it. Um, of course, we always have this new section at the end, which is a little bit more tedious to cut out, but it's okay. I, I've been leaving it in just because some of it's current. So, that was so awesome. Yeah, it was. it's always cool because there was so much... Um, so much information about um i couldn't even i was just like 
Ah, I'm just in awe. So keep going. Show me more pictures. Keep talking. I, I got nothing to say. Uh, yeah, you had shared this one link. Uh, be- before we go into the news, I want to I want to share this this one thing. Okay, I literally had. Uh, this has nothing to do with anything, but it it took me back now. And I, I don't remember what set this off, but there's a video of a guy taking a soda pop bottle and he kind of heats it up and bends it. And it, it literally kicked something in my brain that I had not remembered at all. But back in the day, in the 70s, um, when we used to go to like the carnivals and stuff as kids, one of the prizes that was seemed to be always on one of the you know one of the carnival games or whatever were always these bottles that had these twisted necks uh mm. on them and i was just like and the second that i saw this video and it's only like a little 23 second video but he makes the 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 bottle into a dragon or whatever but that wasn't the part it was just it was just the the way that he bent up the bottle just sparked a memory that I just could not, I was just like, it, I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought at all about those bottles at all. <laughs> Too many. Remember that? Does anybody remember when you used to be able to win these bottles that had these were like long and twisted necks on them? He makes it, he makes this, this glass, it, it makes that into a dragon, but it was just when he twisted that, when he pulled up that bottleneck and twisted it, I don't know what sparked my memory and I'm hoping that I'm not alone, but it was like, uh, thank you. Yes. Maria, Maria says yes. At the states and local fairs, there were always been those. Uh, I, I don't know why I, it, it, I hadn't thought about that at all. And I just happened to be going through a TikTok thing and, and saw, saw them making this bottle. And the second that he pulled that neck up and twisted it, I was like, Oh, it's like, Oh no, that's one of those weird memories. That's, I'm stuck back at the core of my brain. I don't know. I I have no memory of bottles. Uh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. Let's. Uh, I know you want it. You you got a a thing here. I don't know anything about this. You just kind of added this late. I'm gonna pull yeah, it, it up. Something that I uh, that I noticed. Um, Universal Music Group, and uh, you know, some people are who pay attention to music industry stuff, and uh, they're pulling their songs from TikTok. So those who uh, live on TikTok and, and go crazy. Yeah, U- UMG is pulling their music from TikTok. And, and it's a lot of artists. That's a lot of artists. That's amazing. Like how many artists that is that's going to be. And I, I just thought it was really interesting because the agreement was not reached and that contract actually expires tonight. So I'm just like, I always wondered, you know, every single time that like even when I was playing that little that little video of the person taking the bottle and twisting it, it was playing this rap song. I don't know who that was or what that song was. Uh, The artist sounds familiar to me tone wise, but I I don't recognize the song. But I always wondered, you know, okay, just for that little 10 second clip that I played, we're probably going to get hit or it's going to be muted in that section. Um, And then you watch a, a channel like tiktok and they'll have like these full minute videos with full-blown songs and and there's like no they're not getting slapped on the wrist they're not getting because i always just thought it was marketing genius for the music industries to be able to have a one minute clip of the song it's not the whole friggin' song it's just a clip of the song that inspires people or it helps people to you know go and you know right well they struck uh, what is that track originally they 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 made a, a deal where they can play the music and they won't have any issues. But since then they their complaint or their issue is that TikTok's not doing anything for those people that are just taking stuff and stealing basically um, you know, on the music they're not supposed to have, they're still doing it. What I thought was cool or or pretty funny is that TikTok said, you know, tried to negotiate their own version and UMG pretty much said, You only give like we make 1% of what we normally make from TikTok as big as TikTok is. They only make like 1%. So it's really no sweat up. Welcome to how the artists feel. <laughs> right. <laughs> Welcome to how the artists feel. Oh, you get a little taste of your own medicine. Aren't you UMG? Give me a break. 
and that ain't that's not good enough so you pull in your music and you wonder why artists yeah yeah that's so, right. so like, wow well, yeah, here's a little batch of of who is in that mix: Taylor Swift, Bad Bunny, Sting, The Weeknd, Alicia Keys, SZA, uh, Steve Lacey, Drake, Billie Eilish, Kendrick Lamar, Rosalia, Harry Styles, Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, Adele, U2, Elton John, J Balvin, Brandy Carlile, Coldplay, Pearl Jam, Bob Dylan, and Post Malone. That's a lot of artists. Yeah. Taylor Swift's in that mix, obviously. Well, I'm I'm sorry with the Super Bowl. This is probably the first Super Bowl I could give a flying flip about. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I'm probably not gonna. I mean, I could friggin' care less. The only thing I'm, I, I could care less about the Super Bowl at all. I really just, I just, it's wild because I feel the exact same way. I was telling someone that today earlier. Like, I just, this is one of those that I'm like, mm. I just, I'll order some wings and sit back with wings and a Pepsi and, and just, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right. So a lot of people were talking about the Netflix special that uh, launched and uh, mm -hmm. the Netflix special is the greatest night in pop, which is the untold story behind we are the world. Um, and it kind of talks about everybody that was there from Michael Jackson to Lionel Richie, to Stevie Wonder, to Tina Turner, to Huey Lewis and Ray Charles and uh, Cindy Lauper and all these people that were there, Bruce Springsteen. I mean, all these people were there and there are a lot of artists that were in that room, a lot of things to talk about. Yeah. And I was like, I was wondering if uh, I thought to myself, they, they don't even need to bring Prince into this story at all. I mean, right. Obviously, with the album We Are the World, they did have For the Tears in Your Eyes or whatever that was on that collection, and that's fine. But they didn't even talk about the album at all. They only talked about that specific song. I did learn some things uh, watching this. Uh, one was that the song was primarily written by Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, which I did not know. I thought it was Quincy Jones, but apparently from the story, from the documentary, Lionel and Michael Jackson were just sat in the studio and they just kind of put it together. But Michael does not read or write music. So Lionel was saying that he has tapes, a bunch of tapes of Michael Jackson just humming parts because he just didn't, that's all he knows how to do. Uh, but they were the ones that kind of put together We Are The World and then they, they put it, structured it and sent it to Quincy. And then Quincy was just like, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. Um, and uh, Lisa says, did they talk about Madonna as much as Prince? I don't think that they did. Madonna was Madonna there? Madonna wasn't even in, Madonna wasn't in this mix. I don't think. I don't think Madonna was here. I don't. I don't remember them talking about her at all. Um, but they talked about even though Prince wasn't because the the focus of it was we are the world. Um, because if Madonna was there, she would have been one of the soloists of that, but she wasn't there. Well, they didn't say crap about Madonna, but they were trying to get Prince because Prince was at the peak of his game, Purple Rain. He was just won a bunch of awards. Uh, but they were trying to get to Prince and uh, Sheila was invited. And then again, the, the point of this being was that Sheila was invited and she realized as the kind of night went on that she was kind of, you know, looking around the room and she's like, oh, there's Bruce Springsteen. There's, you know, there's all there's all these amazing people. There's Ray Charles. There's Jerry Lewis. There's Lionel Richie. There's Michael Jackson. There's Stevie Wonder. There's Tina Turner. And she's trying to kind of process, trying to validate why she's there in a way. I kind of felt like she was kind of feeling that vibe, even though she was hitting with Glamorous Life and everything. It was, it was, she was out there. But she wasn't out there like that. She wasn't like still, she hadn't reached that legendary status yet. Right. And the documentary kind of focused on the fact that she kind of felt like she was being, she was invited because they were trying to get to Prince. And that's, and, and she even said that in a documentary, she was just like, I just kind of looked around the room and she realized, I realized I'm not going to get a solo out of this. Right. And they keep asking me about Prince. And, um, so at one point in time, she just went to Lionel and, and said, you know, after she realized she wasn't going to get a solo piece of it. So she just said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. Um, 
And a lot of people, it was funny because they focused on things that were just kind of a little bit of a cluster. Mm-hmm. Al Jarreau was drunk. Um, they didn't say specifically he was drunk. They just, they said he just kind of was partying a little too much. And when it came to his part to sing his part, he was too, he was too inebriated to, to even sing his part, you know, like Al Jarreau. I mean, you think of, you know, his work with David Sanborn, you know, since I fell for you, when he's like, you know, he's, you can't, he couldn't do any of the Al Jarreau stuff. And, um, so that was kind of interesting that uh, Waylon Jennings walked out uh, once Stevie Wonder was trying to, because of the fact it was, it was, you know, the was aid for Africa. He was trying to inject a Swahili verse into the song. Mm. And <laughs> Waylon Jennings, what he said, he said, well, ain't no good old boy ever sang Swahili. So I think I'm out of here. <laughs> like, it's just funny to kind of hear all the background stuff. Cause I, and to his credit, can you see Kenny Rogers or, or Waylon Jennings or Bob Dylan or any of these guys singing something in Swahili? It's just like, this is, this just doesn't fit me at all. It's just, you know, <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, so, I mean, it was just interesting, the, the, the stories that were there, and they talked a lot about Prince. I mean, they talked more about Prince than most of the people that were in. They talked more about Prince than they did Tina Turner, than they did Ray Charles, than they did a, a lot of the big artists that were there, and Prince wasn't even there. So it's just, it's it's crazy to me. I just, I just, it was, I, I was like, why are they even bringing him up? He just didn't come. It seemed like if Quincy had any say so or thumb on this documentary as much vitriol as he had for Prince back in that day, even though he didn't, he respected him, mad respected him. Uh, But publicly he was just like, he's all right. He's an okay piano player uh, type of thing uh, that he would have said, we don't even need to be talking about him. But I think, I think the only reason why they even brought it up was because they just wanted to make him try to look like an asshole, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning was. Hmm. All I know was they talked more about Prince than they did most of the people in that room. Well, you, say, you say his name enough times and people flock to it. I don't know. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just funny to me that they just spent so much time focusing on on that particular part of it. So, anyways. All right, next thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just last week, we were saying we were so happy to cross over 58,000 followers on Facebook. And a couple days ago, we crossed in that short period of time, we've already crossed over 59,000 uh, followers. And we should be at sixty over 60,000 followers by the time we get through this weekend. So 60,000 followers on Facebook. We can't thank you enough. Please, if you're listening or watching or or whatever, there are plenty of invites sitting in people's inbox because uh, I look down the list and it says invited, 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 invited. If you've been invited, please go on there and, and click follow. Um, like is cool, but follow is more important because that way you can be keep up to keep abreast of what we're doing. And anytime we go live or anytime we have a special guest or anything, there's something special going on. We want to tell you. So please, please, please. Click on follow if you're on uh, Facebook. Same thing with YouTube. If you're on, follow us on Twitter also. We're now live feeding to Twitter. You kind of pulled uh, Mixcloud and Twitch out of the mix and went with Twitter instead because it's a bigger platform. Right. Uh, so follow us there. Follow us on Facebook also. Uh, and on YouTube, please subscribe on YouTube. It's important. Like the video, subscribe on YouTube. We, we really appreciate it. But yeah, when we crossed over 59, I was like, oh, snap. Wow. This is growing really, really fast. Uh, especially when you listen, especially when you look at the other Prince groups that are out there, it's just not, uh, we seem to be moving very, very, at a very, very fast pace, mainly because of the fact that we're on the air all the time. Uh, pretty much. We don't take a lot of breaks. <laughs> I just don't. We just don't take a lot of breaks. Stuff. I don't know. Yeah, we just. Don't, I just don't take a lot of breaks. I just don't because I just kind of feel like if somebody comes to me and say, "Hey, I would like to be on the show," I'm like, "Okay, I guess we we will do a show." We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I guess we will do a show. That's fine. Uh, but however, next week 
we will be off the air next Tuesday. We will not be next week. We are not beyond because we're doing this show tonight, obviously with Steve Park. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was absolutely positive. Fantastic. And we're going to be live this Saturday during the day too. During the day, which is very, very cool. So for those who don't know the mural that is being done by the amazing Maggie Keene is going to be unveiled in East Point, Georgia on Saturday. And I think the mural is going to be done somewhere, is going to be unveiled somewhere around 12, 12 30, something like that. I would just suggest that you be down there at 12. That's probably when the unveiling is going to be. Let me just say, um, had a little bit of a uh, announcement that literally yesterday, not even well, about a little over 24 hours ago, I was contacted and there are two murals that are going to be unveiled down towards East Point, Georgia on this Saturday. So if you are in Georgia, if you are, this is, and this is just like a, I've actually seen a lot more done on this. This is, it's a, a an amazing mural, by the way, but you guys have not seen the finished one. I haven't even seen the finished one, but there are two murals that are going to be done. Uh, unveiled. N only one of them is done by Maggie Keene and has to do with Prince, and that's this one here. But there's another one that is also going to be done for Robert Smalls. Um, <clears throat> so Robert Smalls' mural is going to be done, uh, I think, at 12 o'clock. And then after that's done, after they unveil the Robert Smalls mural that's going to be done, which is going to be happening right outside of the East Point Printing Company, um, then everybody's going to have to get in their car and what was supposed to happen, let me just be clear, for those who are in Georgia and are thinking about going, and to be clear, we're going to be live streaming this. Uh, and what was supposed to happen was, is there were supposed to be multiple murals happening between this Robert Small mural and the Prince mural. So it was going to be a scenario where you would be able to kind of go down the street and look at all these different murals from one side to the other. It's only these two. Uh, the, I don't know. I can't remember the artist's name of the one that did the Robert Smalls mural, but there's going to be uh, one done for him. And then there's going to be a uh, one for the Prince mural that you just saw the unfinished version of that I just showed you from Maggie Keene that's happening in East Point, Georgia. Here's the new information that I have. At 1030, and I actually have the, actually actually at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, at that first address right there at East Point Printing Company, and for those who are on the app, it is 2759 Church Street in Atlanta, Georgia. And again, that you can just look it up. It's East Point Printing Company. Uh, it's 2759 Church Street, Atlanta. At 10 o'clock, there's going to be a DJ that's going to start playing. Uh, then they're going to start the actual, I guess, ceremony itself, which is going to be indoor. I'm sorry, it's going to be outdoors. Luckily, the weather is going to be fantastic on Saturday. And um, there's going to be people talking, and this is open to the general public. So you can just come if you want to and just, just come. I will be, uh, there's going to be somebody who's going to be speaking um, to talk about the, um, to talk about the Robert Smalls mural. And then I, this is literally a little over 24 hours ago, I found out that I will be speaking and talking about the Prince mural, but I'm going to be talking about Prince's bio and some of his philanthropic efforts, uh, some of the things that he did behind the scenes and um, to kind of help. And it's obviously going to be kicking off Black History Month, which is actually, you know, starts tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so I am actually going to be talking for about seven minutes i'm going to be doing a live thing and there's going to be a lot of people there um a lot of dignitaries a lot of high-end folks including including ludicrous ludicrous will be there also uh he is actually not performing but he's going to actually be there he's part of this event because from 10 30 to 12 um we're going to be i'm going to be speaking at the east point printing company along with some other folks as well that are part of this i'm only going to be talking for about seven minutes i'm in that window i think i'm at like 11 o'clock is where my window is um they're going to unveil the robert smalls mural and then we're going to go from there over to get in your car and go down to the uh prince mural which is at brownie cleaners which is at 3165 east main street in east point georgia 
Um, so they're going to, we're going to take a three minute drive and then we're going to go down there and they're going to unveil that mural. And then from there, it's like walking distance from there, there's going to be a big community party where there's going to be music from Casper and nine Casper nine one one band. If you, uh, they're pretty big. I've seen them playing at St. James all the time. I've never heard them, but they're, I, I know that they're a really good band because they're playing at St. James all the time and you cannot be. You cannot be inferior and not play it. Yeah, St. James has <laughs> got a lot of great, great, great artists, but Casper and 911 band are, uh, they're actually playing. There's going to be food and everything. And that's the part that Ludacris is actually behind as far as, you know, the entertainment and the street party and everything that's actually happened at about one ish, two ish, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably closer to two ish. So get down there, come down to the East point printing company and hang out with, uh, hang out with uh, us and, you hear me talk, and then we're going to go down to the Prince mural. We're going to do the unveiling of that. Also, the, the, the unveiling of the Robert Smalls mural, that also too. So all of those things are going to be very, very cool. Uh, we get to see that Prince mural. We're going to do as much as I can to to do the the Facebook Live. Jeff Page, I assume you're going? Yeah, we'll be there. Okay, so I got to make sure that you have the camera when I'm talking because I am, I'm not going to sit and hold it while I'm talking. But um, uh, anyway, so... We're going to do all that, and then we're going to hang out with uh, crew and have some fun. So if you're not doing anything this Saturday, which is February 3rd, uh, please come down to, and you happen to be in Georgia, you know, don't make you know an insane amount of trip unless you're not doing anything and you're relative driving distance. Mm-hmm. Come down to East Point, Georgia, because we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff. So if you don't have plans and you're like, that's what I'll do. Be there. Come join us. Be there. I will make sure I put this information up on the uh, up on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash Funkatopia. And uh, again, if you're not anywhere near here and you can't make it, uh, we are going to be Facebook living as much as we possibly can. I don't want to Facebook live from 10 until 2. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, it's just, we will, it, we will, we'll try to get some key moments and the key, the key stuff. Yes. For you guys, because you don't need all of everything. Yeah. It's just the good stuff. And so, yeah, the me, the me talking at it part is, was brand new. That did not, as of two days ago, that was not happening. Um, and they wanted somebody who had a lot of background knowledge of prints and, and they were just like, they're like, who, who, in, who in the Georgia area talks about prints friggin' nonstop. <laughs> they were just like, I know a guy. And so that guy ended up being me. So it's going to be fun. We're going to check it out. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be lots of uh, elbow rubbing to um, music industry folks and political folks and whatnot. So there's going to be a lot of that stuff going on because it is an election series and there's a couple East Point folks that are going to be running for mayor. And so there's going to be a lot of handshaking and, you know, people trying to impress folk. Shake a lot of hands. I don't shake a lot yeah. of hands. <laughs> or you can, do the, you can do the bro hug. Hey, you get the you get the bro hug. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it um, because I am not prepared whatsoever. I know that they want to. Um, and shout out to Nadine, Nadine Rivers Johnson, who when they were saying who in this who in Georgia talks about Prince nonstop, and Nadine was like, uh, Mr. Christopher for sure. <laughs> he does not shut up. So let's just do that. And uh, so I'm going to have to like commit everything to what I'm saying on uh, uh, on paper <laughs> because there's dignitaries and stuff. So I've got to get things cleared and all that It'll stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm not worried about it. I just uh, I just overthink things when I have to commit it to paper. I just like you got I your just, alpha brain. <laughs> yeah, got my alpha brain and also my etch a sketch brain working side by side. That's right. Yeah. So anyways, um, man, I hope you guys had a fantastic time. What a great night. Got an interview, uh, Steve Park, who I've wanted to have on the show for a while. So I'm glad that he finally agreed to come on. It's going to be awesome. And um, it's going to be incredible. It's, it's going stuff. to be incredible. It was awesome stuff. Like I said, yeah, I, man. I couldn't even speak. It was just like, ah, let this roll. <laughs> I try to not, especially when they're telling stories. There are certain people that we've we've had on the show before when they start telling stories, you just don't you just don't talk. 
let them go. I mean, the best show, one of the best shows I ever did was uh, one where I, I barely talked at all, which was when uh, I had Damon D and Wally Safford, uh, who, 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 Wally and Damon were like really hardcore, like buds, like inseparable type of dudes. And they hadn't talked to each other in years, like years, 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 years. And I got them on the show at the same time. And they just started cutting up and sharing stories and sharing memories. And it was just like this banter back and forth. And I just, I just sat back and just let it happen. I was just like, I'm not saying anything. Yep. I'm not saying anything. And I think I had the, the, or a co-host that time was Nikki Tuzio, I think. And Nikki was kept on trying to interject while there were <laughs> stories. And I'm like texting him, like, don't say anything. Just talk, just let don't say anything. Just let him talk. And uh, yeah, that was a great show. That was a lot of fun. Hey, Damon. Damon D's in the house. <laughs> Look at Damon. There he is. Yeah, it was like just Damon and Wally just just talking and just going. And uh, that was a great show because I loved that they were just in that memory zone and just going down memory lane. And that's just, those are always the best shows because Absolutely. you never know what's going to say. Yeah. You never know what kind of gold's going to come out of that. That's where the magic is. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, yes, it was recorded. Um, <laughs> Damon's like, that was my dude. Yeah. I miss Wally greatly. I got plenty of, uh, plenty of Wally stories. For sure, my my last one of my best stories one one of the celebrate the one of the posthumous celebrations and we sat in that Wally and I sat just me and him sat in the hotel lobby of the American uh, across the street from the host hotel. We, that's we were like I'm not paying that money. We we, just, we went to the American and me and Wally sat in that lobby for hours or probably at least a couple hours and just sat and just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and it was just like he was just. Wally was an amazing dude and I miss him greatly. Um, he's just one of those dudes, man. It's just, but I talk with him for hours on the phone in the middle of the night. He's just one of those dudes, man. But anyways, thank you so much. <laughs> and Jeff always gets frustrated with me because he's like, oh yes, we're closing up. He's saying bye. And then he starts going off. <laughs> and you're just like, God dang, where's he going now? <laughs> just, just shut up, Mr. Christopher. Just stop talking. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, thank you for doing the support scroll to, uh, support us, please. One-time donations. You can go to Venmo at Funkatopia, F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A. Cash app is dollar sign Funkatopia, Funkatopia. And of course we want you to join the Patreon group because, and this is a really good time because tomorrow is the first. So I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm going to be sending out to, uh, supporters, Patreon doc, a bunch of, I got some music files and stuff that I think are really, really cool uh, that I think you're going to want to hear. Patreon.com slash Funkatopia is every not a member. Get on there now because I only do it on the first or second and then I'm, I don't do it during the month because some of you folks. Patreon.com slash Funkatopia, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Funkatopia, F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A. Get some music tomorrow. I already got some stuff set aside. Oh yeah, we got to pick out uh, the um, pick out the the winner of that book before we go. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Orion's Dream. Are you located uh, in the states? Uh, and while I'm waiting for that answer, uh, Jacqueline Sills where wants to know was it um, was that show recorded with? And I already answered this. Damon D and uh, Wally Safford. And it was. You can just go to. Uh, you can go to Google and search for, or just go to SoundCloud or Spotify or iHeartRadio and just search for Funkatopia, Wally Safford, Damon D, and you'll you'll find it. Oh, Orion's Dream is in South Carolina. All right, Orion's Dream, uh, you got the book. You got it. Just go ahead and send me your address. Send it to funkatopia at gmail.com. That's F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A at gmail.com. Send me your address, and we'll try to get that book out tomorrow, man. Letty Beeson, my brother from another mother. Glad to see you in the house as well. Damon D, my brother from another mother from the NPG. Thank you so much for all the music and all the memories. And uh, you guys are amazing. Good night, everyone. We hope that you had a fantastic time. We will see you this Saturday. Remember, we are off the air next week. But this Saturday, we will be going live. So there will be two shows this week. So we're taking nothing. Because, Jeff, you're out of town, right? So I think so. 
Maybe. I think you said you were out of town. Yeah, I just didn't tell the world. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> well, he's he's taking all of his stuff with him. <laughs> I'm taking everything with me. <laughs> I got security cameras. <laughs> uh, he's insured. All right, everybody. Thank you guys so, so much. And we hope that you have a fantastic time. We will see you on Saturday, if nowhere else, for sure. Good night, everyone. Have a good time. Thank you for tuning in to Funkatopia Live. I'm your host, Mr. Christopher, Jeff Page in the house. See you guys. See you later. Bye now. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,